Okay, well, it being uh, just after nine o'clock, I declare open this meeting of the Senate Environment and Communications Legislation Committee. The Senate has referred to the committee the particulars of proposed expenditure and particulars of certain proposed expenditure for 2021 for the portfolios of agriculture, water and the environment, industry, science, energy and resources and infrastructure, transport, regional development and communications. The committee is due to report to the Senate on Tuesday, the 17th of November 2020, and has fixed Thursday, the 3rd of December 2020, as the date for return of answers to questions taken on notice for agricultural water and the environment, the infrastructure, transport, regional development and communications, and Thursday, the 10th of December 2020, for industry, science, energy and resources. Today's committee proceedings so will continue its examination of the communications and arts outcomes of the infrastructure, transport, regional development and communications portfolio. Senators, departments and agencies have been provided with advice on the arrangements that are in place to ensure these hearings are conducted in a COVID safe environment. This guidance is also available from the Secretariat. The committee appreciates the cooperation of all attendees in adhering uh, to these arrangements. The committee will be conducting today's hearing in person and via video conference. Uh, thank you in advance for your patience with any technical issues we may encounter along the way. Uh, those participating via video conference are reminded to mute their devices when they do not have the call. And uh, can I just make the point that experience over the last couple of days has highlighted that uh, the practice of intervening, interjecting or over-talking while somebody is on a video call makes it very problematic for people to hear. So can I ask people to respect the normal civilities of debate uh, whereby uh, you allow the other person to finish their contribution and then uh, engage appropriately. Um, Understanding Order 26, the committee must take all evidence in public session and this includes answers to questions on notice. Officers and senators will be familiar with the rules of the Senate governing estimates hearings. If you need assistance, the Secretariat has copies of the rules. The Senate has resolved also that an officer of the Commonwealth shall not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy and shall be given reasonable opportunities to refer questions asked of the officer to a superior officer or to a minister. This resolution prohibits only questions asking for opinions on matters of policy and does not preclude questions asking for explanation to policies or factual questions about when and how policies were adopted. I particularly draw the attention of witnesses to an order of the Senate of the 13th of May 2009 specifying the process by which a claim of public interest immunity should be raised. Witnesses are specifically reminded a statement that information or a document is confidential or consists of advice to government is not a statement that meets the requirements of the 2009 order. Instead, witnesses are required to provide some specific indication of the harm to the public interest that could result from the disclosure of the information or the document. Officers called upon for the first time to answer a question should state their full name and position for the Hansard record, and witnesses should speak clearly into the microphones again to assist Hansard. Mobile phones should be switched to silent. I welcome back Senator the Honourable Jane Hume, Assistant Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and Financial Technology, representing the Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts and Portfolio Officers. Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement? No, I don't. I also welcome Ms Christine Holgate, Group Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of the Australian Post Corporation and Officers. Uh, Ms Holgate, do you wish to make a short opening statement? I do, please. Please make a short opening statement. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, we have members of the media who would like to take photographs. Is there any objection from members of the committee or the um, witnesses? There being none, then you may take photographs in accordance with the normal rules. Thank you. Ms Holgate. Thank you. Senators, this has been one of the most challenging years in our recent history, from bushfires to floods and then a global pandemic but the importance of Australia Post supporting communities has again proved critical. Last week, our 2020 annual report was tabled in Parliament. We're very proud of the results the business delivered, achieving a record revenue of $7.5 billion, of 500 million or 7%, as our business continues to transform. Our results were underpinned by very strong performance in our parcel products, delivering strong operational efficiencies, and tight cost control. Although our operational costs 
did rise as we supported significantly increased deliveries, which accelerated when COVID-19 hit. Swift action on discretionary costs has enabled us to redirect investment to the front line in order to keep our people safe and provide a lifeline to thousands of businesses and homes across the country who have become increasingly dependent on us. The profit before tax result for the year at 53.6 million was up 30% ahead of our targets and we were pleased we avoided a loss which so many of our international peers have done. Our results mask that letter losses in the year rose to 242 million, reflecting the 400 million fall in letter volumes to 2.4 billion. In the six months since COVID began, our letters have fallen 287 million. And to put that in perspective, that's about the equivalent to the whole of the letters left remaining in New Zealand. But letters still remain a very important part of our business. We are working very closely with the electoral commissions currently in Queensland and Victoria to ensure that current voting goes smoothly. We've delivered almost 300, mil 300 million parcels since COVID began. The parcels have not only risen in number, they have also in weight and size. I thank the committee for the support of the temporary regulatory relief. It has been critical in helping us deliver these. Parcels now represent 61% of our group revenues as our business continues to transform and grow. In a recent survey by Deloitte Access Economics, four out of every five Australians stated that Australia Post was essential through the crisis and highlighted we've helped facilitate a further $4.2 billion in economic contribution since the pan pandemic began and helped thousands of businesses remain viable and open and to be able to keep their employees in jobs. Protecting our people from the beginning of this crisis has been our greatest priority. We've introduced split shifts, safe distancing, temperature testing, pandemic leave and track and trace monitoring to help keep our people safe. Out of our almost 80,000 extended workforce, we have only one case of COVID-19 contracted at work. I'd like to thank our union partner, led by Mr. Greg Rainier, for working with us and protecting the safety of our people. We are very proud of how our people have adapted to the changing circumstances we have found ourselves in. It is very encouraging to hear their feedback, reflecting their optimism about working in a business that's growing again, and their appreciation for training and access to better conditions. The continuing Victoria Stage 4 lockdown has caused further delivery challenges as restrictions tightened while e-commerce significantly increased. In order to meet the strict safety guidelines of the Victorian Government, we have needed to, we have needed to be able to work very differently. At our busiest time, we were restricted to have only 67% of our people in our facility. And we also have a four metre rule, which also restricted how our posties could work and how much they could deliver. We are working very closely with the Victorian government as we prepare for the market to open up again. Looking forward, we are planning for a Christmas like no other. It is estimated that this year's Christmas shopping could be worth more than $4 billion, with consumers predicting they will spend more online by about 25%. We are investing significantly in our delivery and customer service capability. We will be employing more than 5,000 additional employees to deliver customers' parcels, help in contact centres and in our post offices. We have 3,000 more vehicles on the road this year than last. We know we'll have 18 dedicated air freighters and we are increasing the sectors they fly to by 88%. We will give more stops to South Australia, Tasmania, Northern Territory and Perth as we want to help ensure all Australians have a good Christmas. We will open 47 extra delivery sites and we will open up 30 more post offices and we will be introducing more options for our people and customers to collect their parcels and to improve our customer notifications. We will do all we can, Senators, to ensure our customers and communities have, are really supported through this, customer, through this Christmas period. As I reflect back on the last six months, 
it has certainly been challenging, but I am so proud of our people and appreciate sincerely their support, including from our extended partners, our delivery drivers and licensed post offices. Through their innovation, adaptability and resilience, Australia Post has offered an economic lifeline to so many and has paved the way forward for a sustainable new future for ourselves, a future where our post offices can flourish, where our posties and delivery teams maintain their jobs, where our, where our communities secure services and a future which can support the economic recovery of our country. Our purpose in connecting Australians has not changed. How we're doing it has. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the recommendations from the recent Senate inquiry into the temporary regulatory relief. We thank the Senate for their ongoing support and we can confirm the whole ET have embarked on a training to improve our engagement with the Senate. We also have considered the feedback shared in questioning. For example, the opportunity shared by Senator Carr to explore a partnership with Stealth, a local auto manufacturing company in Victoria, and we can update more on that later. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much. Um, just for the committee's information, I've had a request from the media that they can get a more front-on shot for the media for the next five minutes or until another senator arrives. You can come down to uh, next to Senator Davey to get a better aspect, but then please move back. Senator Carr, I think you are... Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Ms Holley, um, and can I might just just these remarks to the, your executive as well, um, and I welcome the Minister. But can I just indicate, uh, and thank you for your opening remarks, the, on behalf of the Labor Party, I'll just indicate there is uh, a very strong level of interest from the Labor Party, which I think reflects a strong interest across the parliament as to the work of the Australia Post as an essential public institution. And I think that also reflects a very strong public interest in your work, and we just want to indicate that this will be an ongoing interest for us. Uh, it's not just a um, temporary question because of the circumstances that have arisen as a result of your request for the changes uh, to certain regulatory matters. Uh, and we did, in fact, seek to have uh, ongoing parliamentary committee, a scrutiny committee, uh, to ensure that we're able to provide better oversight of Australia Post, uh, and we maintain that interest uh, in doing so. I want to emphasise it's not about personal animus to any individual. It's about our responsibilities to ensure that Australia Post operates in terms of its accountability to the Australian people through the parliament. Uh, and having said that, can I just come back to the report, the recent Senate uh, committee report, which uh, made some recommendations in regard to what uh, unanimously committee members held to be a concern regarding the way in which Australia Post was responding to its parliamentary responsibilities. And that recommendation went to the issue of training and the issue of parliamentary privilege and the questions are relating to the way in which Australia Post was responding to questions that were being put to it. And I'm wondering, have you uh, had an opportunity to study that report? The um, report from the inquiry. Yeah, this is the yes, Future Senator. of Australia Post Services Delivery, August yes, 2020. We all have. Thank you. And the specific recommendation regarding training as recommended uh, and the Senate resolution to that effect. That's correct, Senator. Can you tell me what you've done about that? Absolutely. We've had, we've engaged with the, I think you call it the AGS, the Australian Government Solicitors, and we had a two-hour briefing, and I'll ask one of my colleagues to remember the gentleman's name. We also engaged with a, um, a gentleman called Richard Herr, if I recall correctly, from the University of Tasmania, and we had about a two-and-a-half-hour briefing with him, we also have planned further briefings with both the AGS and the specialists from the University of Tasmania. And we have made a commitment as a team 
to have an ongoing programme to be able to ensure that we do understand. And Senator, I respect your comments. I, you know, we come from different backgrounds, we're not senators, and we're very committed to being able to engage with you more effectively. Yes, I, I saw your public comments to the effect that you weren't senators. Uh, no other statutory authority or government business agency is made up of senators either. In fact, there's a prohibition on that. Uh, it, it's not about whether or not you sit on this side of the table. It's a whether or not there is an understanding of the responsibilities of executives of government business enterprises and or statutory authorities uh, in terms of the relationship to the parliament. That, that was the point of the recommendation. Um, so has your briefings gone to that issue? Yes, they have, Senator. And do you think there's been uh, any need for Australia Post to change its approach? I think there's always opportunity for all of us to continue to learn and develop and improve our engagement, and we're very committed to doing that. Is it the case that you've engaged uh, external counsel as well as consulting the Australian Government solicitor? Yes, I think I just mentioned we've engaged a gentleman from the University of Tasmania. Mm. Yes, that's an academic. Is there any other legal uh, advice that you've sought other than the Australian Government solicitor? Um, not to my nose, but perhaps my colleague so I don't mislead you, um, Mr. Nick MacDonald can answer. Uh, Christine, um, my name is Nick MacDonald. I'm General Counsel and Corporate Secretary of Australia Post. Uh, thank you, Senator, for your questions. Uh, to answer directly, uh, we have not engaged other external counsel for advice uh, in relation to our uh, compliance uh, Senate uh, process requirements. Uh, but uh, if I can add to my colleagues' comments, we, we do take our obligations to the Senate very seriously. Uh, and as um, you know, mentioned, we have commenced uh, an ongoing training program uh, with the Australian Government Solicitor. The presenter that uh, Christine referred to is Guy Aitken of Queen's Cap, uh, who um, we were informed is a, a renowned expert in this space. Uh, and he has conducted a session uh, with our executive team. We've also had training sessions with other Australia Post personnel that are involved in preparing um, our executives for appearances at Senate estimates and responding to uh, questions on notice. Uh, we're going training with the Australian Government Solicitor and we've also asked them to work with us to prepare resources so that as people join the organisation and move into these sorts of roles, uh, they're appropriately briefed and prepared for giving those um, serious responsibilities and obligations in the way that the Senate would expect. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether or not you've thought it might be appropriate to actually contact officials of the Senate rather than just the Australian Government solicitor in regard to having an understanding of parliamentary procedures. Nick, would you like to answer? Sure. Uh, look, I understand the Personally, I wasn't involved in this, but I understand that there was some interaction with the, the Senate committee around what some options might be in respect of uh, engaging uh, with the Senate and uh, the expectations that we must meet. Uh, and that was what led to the engagement of the academic uh, that Ms Holgate mentioned, uh, Richard Hur. So uh, certainly uh, we did give considerable thought to the best way in which to approach uh, the recommendation in the Senate inquiry report. Uh, and what the, the engagement with the Australian Government solicitor was, was one of those measures. Uh, but absolutely, we're open to other suggestions on how we might do that effectively, Senator. I, I would, perhaps uh, the Secretary of this committee might be able to give you some advice on matters that relating to parliamentary procedures and the best source of advice within this, uh, the Department of the Senate, for instance, it might be of use to you in that uh, matter. And uh, advice as to the points of contact yeah, in I, the Senate. I thought that's what you said. I just I didn't quite catch that in the response there. Uh, uh, perhaps I missed it, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, the uh, 
so can I be clear though, you haven't engaged uh, external counsel uh, or lawyers to assist with estimates preparations? Nick, uh, no. answer that's no. No, all we've done the Australian government's solicitor. That's, thank you. Um, I'm wondering, um, the terms of the, the questions on notice that have come uh, back through to this committee, <coughs> are they go through your government relations team or are they being managed somewhere else within Australia Post? Um, our questions are noted. <coughs> Sorry, Nick, do you want to answer? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so questions on notice uh, will come in through my team, so the corporate secretary team, uh, and then a member of my team coordinates with representatives across the business to gather the information that's been requested, uh, and then that information is provided back to uh, the department um, to contribute to their response or their preparation of the response to the questions mm -hmm. on notice. So the, they go through the department through to the minister's office, is Mr. Windows? Uh, can, can I just ask the deputy secretary if he can assist me on the formal process? Is that how it works? Uh, uh, yes, Richard Windy, deputy secretary uh, in the department. Um, the, the normal process. I mean, there are, there are there would be questions on notice which the department has been asked, which yes, might that. require seeking of information. But, uh, I'm from thinking Australia about Post. Australia Post. The Australia Post questions on notice do, um, as part of, in a sense, as part of the process of getting them um, to the minister's office and ultimately to be tabled, do come to us and then we um, pass them through to the minister's office. Then are they edited by the department or the minister's office? Uh, Senator, we would um, uh, we 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 look at the answers, but we don't um, we don't edit them as such. They're not um, their answers for Australia Posts uh, for Australia Post, so it's not our we're not we're not in the business of editing um, editing their answers. If there are occasions where we pick something up that we think um, needs to be you know a, 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 an error or something that needs we think might be worth considering we might pass that back to Australia Post but mm. by and large we well, might be a factual error for instance possibly um, but by and large we're passing them through to the minister's office yes. for and, tabling and it's the minister's office ever edited an answer uh, from Australia Post uh, let's I, just take I the would last, have to take that on notice last Senator. six months well I'd have to take that on notice thank Senator. you uh, and the, on what occasions that's occurred? We'll take that on. Thank you very much. And the um, Ms. Holger, there's the, been a request to have a spillover day uh, arranged so that we can have a talk to the chairman of the board. Has that date been fixed yet? Not to my knowledge. What's the hold-up? Um, uh, may I pass to Mr MacDonald? Uh, Senator Carr, that hasn't been formally considered by the committee yet. Oh, I see. So I don't think Australia Post has been advised of a, uh, a request for a So it's a hold up on this end, is there? Yes. I see. Yeah. Uh. Uh, Senator Kitching had raised the request, but in terms of the chair appearing, but we haven't, to my knowledge, had a request for a spillover to facilitate that yet. Right. I understood there was a question about getting an agreed day. Perhaps we'll have a private meeting to discuss All that right. later. Thank but you. Uh, at this stage, no, the committee has not set a date. Well, thank you. Uh, the uh, Ms Holgate, I understand the Australia Post has had an e-commerce summit. That was yesterday, is that right? That is correct, S Senator. Uh, in fact, it runs for two days, Senator. Yeah, yes, but you, you're, you were scheduled to appear here yesterday, so, and it was, there's been a change in the program to accommodate your appearance. Um, I'm not aware of that, Senator. I was told I needed to be here today at nine o'clock. I've never been, to my knowledge, been asked to appear at any other time. I see. Um, I, I've been advised that. Uh, there was a difficulty with your diary and that the change in arrangements actually was to accommodate the East Summit. And you're so, not aware of that. Nick, do you want to respond? 
Uh, certainly. Uh, thank you. Thank you, um, Ms Hoggart. Um, so, Senator, uh, when we were originally advised of the dates of these sittings, uh, we were advised that it was uh, the 21st and the 22nd of October. Uh, we had a, a pre-arranged e-commerce of it, so this was had, had been in place for some time. We corresponded with the committee to advise them of that um, e-commerce summit uh, and requested in effect the indulgence of being considered for appearance today rather than yesterday mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, our CEO and other executives could open that summit. That request was framed respectfully uh, and understanding that ultimately we need to appear we were requested to appear and it was simply a request to be considered. Uh, we were very grateful that the committee considered that request and scheduled things so that we could appear today. Uh, but it was certainly uh, not anything more than that. Okay. So when was the e-commerce summit uh, arranged? Um, Senator, may I ask my colleague, Ms Nicole Sheffield, who um, was in charge of coordinating the whole event? Thank you. Hello, Senator Nicole Sheffield, Executive General Manager, Community and Consumer. We have had been uh, discussing the e-commerce summit with the Australian, which is actually the Australian's e-commerce summit since June of this year. June? Yes. It's just that the Senate budget estimates hearings, uh, I understand, were scheduled from the 14th of May. Is that correct? That's correct. So, and, and this is... Uh, a normal practice, this is my point about procedural questions, it's not just a question of uh, inconvenience. Uh, these proceedings are supposed to take some priority. Uh, and, and if my understanding is correct, that they were advised on the 14th of May, and you're organising another event with the Australian in June, it does suggest to me that someone hasn't logged these estimates proceedings in the CEO's diary when they've been notified. And these should Sorry, take priority. Sorry, Nick, do you want to update? Apologies. Uh, thank you, Christine. Uh, yes, Senator, we, we acknowledge that these hearing dates should absolutely take priority. Uh, and our request for a consideration of the hearing today was put on the basis uh, that if we could accommodate it, we are grateful, but uh, there was certainly no expectation. In terms of the scheduling of uh, the Senate, oh, sorry, the, um, the summit, uh, we had a placeholder in our diaries for the 20th of October. As I understand it, the dates of the 20th and the 20, 21st and the 22nd were not set until quite recently. Uh, and once we became aware of that conflict, uh, we raised that issue with the Senate committee and asked for that indulgence and I'm grateful for that. My, my point is, you're advised in May that this was the date. The conflict occurs at your end in June or perhaps later. But once you're advised in May that this is the date that the Senate set, I, I'm, not, I'm trying to emphasise that this is a question of priority for all the other statutory authorities and all the other CEOs have to meet that criteria. And I'm, it does highlight the issue for you too, I would suggest. So, thank you, Senator. We absolutely appreciate that uh, this takes priority, uh, but the setting of the dates of the 21st and 22nd wasn't advised to us until, I believe, September. Uh, we were aware that there was a sitting in October uh, but the particular clash wasn't apparent to us until relatively recently. Uh, in any event, had that clash remained and had we not been accommodated, we would have been here, not at the e-commerce summit, and we would have Thank found you. a way to make it work. Senator, uh, just, just for complete uh, clarity, my understanding is that the dates are published, but the agency is not specifically advised until closer to the date. So your point perhaps still remains valid. They should be looking out for it, but, yeah, yeah. but so, in, so in terms of being well. advised, the advice didn't come till later. The other point I just make for complete clarity is the information that was sent to Australia Post uh, referred them to the uh, procedural and research section within the Department of the Senate, but it did also note that one of the training providers for the course which was run for SES officers engaging with the Senate Senior Executive Service training uh, is the University of Tasmania. Thank you.
The, uh, can I ask you in regard to the operations of the uh, ADM, uh, how, uh, is it Mr Barnes, you're responsible, is Mr Barnes there? Yes, he is. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, the alternative day delivery model, are you able to assist me with questions in that regard? Uh, yes, Senator Rob Barnes. Thank you. Uh, so the modelling that was undertaken, uh, that was taken back in, in March and April? Uh, about April, Senator. And uh, what were the outputs for the modelling at the time? Um, at the time, we were trying to be um, added significant volume parcels uh, through the business from the peak last year, so we were we had a deficit of capacity. Uh, excuse me, Ms. Mr. Barnes, uh, could you please come a bit closer to your microphone? It's uh, very difficult to hear you. How's that, Senator? That's better, thank you. Is that better? Okay, I'll come closer. Um, so we had uh, modelling. Move or failed by a fixed term resource for our person doing letters and parcels so that we could cope with more parcel deliveries. We also had a significant downfall in letters and full cars further downfall. I'm sorry. That Mr. was to Mr. be realised. Mr. Barnes, I'm sorry, it's uh, quite unintelligible. Uh, Ms. Holgate, is there someone else from your team who could provide this information? Yes. Yeah, is so that so better, I think, Rod. Either you have to try and get be very close to the microphone or maybe dial in from a mobile phone. Senator Fawcett, would that yes, be Yes, I think there is a facility for a telephone. The Secretariat or Hansard, sorry, Broadcast will be in contact with you, Mr Barnes, and we'll put you on to an uh, alternate phone contact. Is that uh, better, Senator? Just, we, the Broadcast will call you uh, on a phone. Okay, thank you. If there are any other questions there regarding... Are, but, uh, would you like to wait for Mr Barnes? Well, is it, uh, is no. it likely to be long, do you think? Probably not, but what I might do, you've had uh, more... Yes, I have, that's true. Yes, I will yes, go fair to enough. Senator Davey for some yes. questions, and then we'll come back to you, yeah. Senator Carr. Thank you very Thank you much, sir. Chair. Um, I'm, uh, I have a few questions um, regarding... There was a press release put out by a uh, member from Maranoa, David Littleproud, on the 25th of August regarding... Um, Australia Post rates from regional areas. Um, he had uh, assisted a constituent who had a contract with Australia Post, I believe. Um, so I just, I just want to get a bit of an understanding about regional rates versus metro rates, why there's a difference, um, particularly since I note that um, Following a, a comprehensive review, um, you have actually implemented a flat rate rate for parcel services for retail. So if I go to the post office in Deniliquin, I'm paying exactly the same parcel rates as someone who goes to the post office in Sydney. So why, when you have contract customers, are there separate rates for metro versus regional? If I could pass to my colleague, Mr. Um, Gary Starr, he's very familiar with that particular customer and that incident. Gary. Thank you. Uh, Gary Starr, Executive General Manager of Business and Government and uh, International. Thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, so, yes, we did. Um, firstly, just in terms of the cost factors that drive um, the career of parcel size and uh, weight and distance and, of course, drop density, so in regional rural areas, less parcels are delivered um, to factor into pricing. And so the pricing does vary by what we call the lane based on where it's coming from and going to. Um, and uh, we did meet with that customer and liaise with uh, the, the member's office. Um, and the customer, was, you, it's correct, the customer uh, was unhappy with the rates that they had for their contract. But for only certain lanes, so for certain, uh, you know, with, with a process starting and going to, and we were able to demonstrate that as a package, the customer was better off um, with the contract rates, and 
we're able to demonstrate that we have done with other customers that it is a better offer overall uh, than the rates, you know, the over-the-counter rates or the my post business rates for smaller customers. Um, it's a better offer than the retail satchels. And so that's uh, fundamentally, um, you know, that that's when we landed. So we met with the customer on the 19th of August and, and we were able to get to a point where they were satisfied with the rates. We are, just, just to add to that, Senator, we are going through a process to reduce um, the number of different you know, price points. As you said, there's a national structure for retail, which, which made it simple for a customer to come into the post office to lodge a parcel. For our contract customers, where they have you know, literally hundreds or thousands of, of destinations that they, they, they send parcels to their customers, we are reducing complexity by moving down from 64 different zones to either six or nine zones, and that will simplify the price significantly. And we always do take into account the regional and rural pricing. Uh, but you know, for, for a, a merchant or a retailer or any customer that's sending you know, multiple parcels like on a contract, or typically more than 2,000 parcels a year, um, they will be sending all different, to all different locations. And so our pricing reflects those different zones and the costs associated with delivering. Senator, may I add, um, we've made a commitment to um, Ms. the Honourable Mr Little Proud that we'd actually go back and actually, before we introduce a whole new thing, seek some feedback and make sure it was actually meeting the sort of community, business community needs before it actually gets um, implemented. Um, yes, that's right. I, I note that he has uh, outlined the commitment you have made, a, a commitment to review the pricing architecture and design a clearer, mm. simple office, uh, offer for customers across the board. Um, can you just tell me how you're going to go about that review? What sort of consultation are you going to do? And, and will there be a focus on ensuring that you include regional businesses in that consultation? Absolutely. I'll let Mr Starr um, answer in a moment, but we're very aware that regional customers have a bigger dependency on us because there's less competition there. And they're very, you know, that's where our post offices are, our people are. 65% of our people are in regional Australia. So we're very committed. Gary, do you want to talk through how we normally do consultation? Because you've been doing a lot at the moment with customer groups. That's, that's right, uh, Christine. So yes, we, um, we engage. So of course, our, our rate structures have to accommodate the smallest customers. And we do that either over the counter or with my post business. Um, and just as an example of that, my post business, um, which is used by hundreds of thousands of customers, um, they, um, you know, we were, they were looking at how can they, how could we deliver better uh, pricing for, as, as they grow. And so we did introduce, recently introduce uh, two new uh, price bands so that um, there were savings along the way. And that was through lots of, and lots of uh, consultation with customers. Um, and so my post business pricing has now been, um, the, the new bands are rolled out and that means customers do start um, saving earlier and saving as they spend more. Um, similarly, with larger customers, we, we have lots of um, consultation with customer groups as we, um, as we look at changing pricing. And one of the things, the biggest single thing that the feedback we receive is complexity, make it simpler. And um, as Ms. Holgate mentioned, the, the simplified retail pricing was step one. Um, and that meant, you know, it just made it much simpler for customers to understand how to, to pack their parcel and post it. And the pricing was simple. Um, and the national flat rates, as you mentioned, Senator, um, we increased the bands in my post business, again, through consultation with small business from three to five zones, the larger discounts. And similarly for our larger, for our corporate customers, and larger customers that spend more, and, and as I said, ship to many more places um, through feedback, they've made it clear that simplicity is what they want, that makes simplified bills, uh, simplified in terms of into integrating with our systems. And so we're looking to move from 64 zones through, through that feedback down to this new six nine zone format. So we have completed that, that customer feedback and consultation, and we're now working through 
um, migrating customers over the next period of time. So as their contracts come up for renewal, uh, we're working with customers to migrate them to this new simplified pricing. Um, and this is this is the major change to help avoid you know, some of the feedback that from um, uh, Dave Littleproud, the Honourable Dave Littleproud, was around again around simplification and that customer in particular being confused between if I lodge over the counter, it's different to my contract. And so we've explained it to that customer and we do to many others, but this is to simplify the architecture overall, which will make it much easier for customers to understand pricing. Sounds um, good. I certainly acknowledge that uh, customers on contracts um, are getting special rates due to you know, their, their increased um, use of Australia Post. It still, however, doesn't really answer the question of why you can have um, flat rate pricing for retail customers, regional metro, um, but contract customers are paying a different rate, regional or metro, um, for, for their... Uh, my, my concern is, and it, I, I understand that this was one specific customer and, and you worked, I commend Australia Post for working with both um, Minister Littleproud and the customer to come to a, a satisfactory resolution. However, there must be a lot of regionally based contract customers with Australia Post who are paying a higher rate for parcel services purely based on where they live uh, and, uh, you know, regional businesses would quite rightly be asked why they're being penalised or why they're... Um, just because they don't live in an urban area. Because one of the examples that, that uh, this customer did quite rightly put forward is it is cheaper to post from capital city to capital city, uh, regardless of distance, than it is to post from a regional area a much shorter distance to another regional area. Um, I acknowledge that as the crow flies and I acknowledge that the postal services, you would go into Warwick and it probably goes back to Brisbane before coming out again. However, that is, um, that's not the customer's fault. So uh, is one of the things you're looking at putting contract customers on a single rate regardless of whether it's a metro or regional service? Senator, we are looking at significantly simplifying and it, it sounds like you're very familiar with what we're doing in the retail environment where we took 256 price points down to five. It was way too confusing and I think with this particular customer there was an element of that which I totally understand when you've got that many price points and secondly with business customers there's also a thing about the weight and dimension, which unfortunately their parcel was falling into a different demand. I'd like to, so we are trying to address that. I'd like to pick up just one other point, if I may. One of the programs that we've been working on, and this has come out of um, much customer feedback, is how do we leverage our regional post office network to actually ensure that we have stronger engagement with small business customers who aren't in metro areas. We've had 88 post offices trained up in what we call a local business partnering program, and there are now 500 going through training. We hope that by having almost 600 of our licensees going through this training program, that we can actually provide face-to-face -face significantly better support to business customers who are regional and a long way from the metro centre. Nicole and I were just actually last week in Adelaide and we met with a lot of the local um, LPOs actually who'd been on this programme or going on that programme. And the initial observations of it are very successful, both from business customers, but also in the preservation of the viability of our post offices. Um, and I, I would just like to put on record how important the, those post offices are, particularly in regional areas, Absolutely. and what a great service that um, the franchisees and, and the, the, their staff um, do out in the bush. So I, I commend all of them for that. 
Just back on, on the review, um, Mr Starr, you said that um, you've completed the customer feedback section of it, you're going through and you will then be working to migrate uh, customers onto the simpler, um, simpler uh, costs. And will the results of your review be made public? Will you be producing a report that outlines um, future cost structures for Australia Post and for, so for your business customers? Because I, I note that you've already done a significant amount of work for retail customers. Yeah. I think that uh, the simplified format there is working. Um, so, but will you also be making the business customers not not the individual customers, but the structure and framework public so that business customers will have access. So, so we've, so the, the Senator, thanks for the question. And yes, so firstly, moving from 64 typically and some customers thousands of price points down to this six nine zone pricing will make an enormous difference. We are communicating it to customers. I would just call out that it is a highly competitive market, um, this, part, this logistics parcels market. And so we wouldn't necessarily signal, we will certainly communicate with our customers and we are every day. Um, and, and then one by one, as their contracts come up for renewal, uh, we, you know, and that's happening every month, every day, every month, we work through the migration from the, the regime they're on to this new six or nine zone regime and, um, and, and proactively communicating with them um, because that's clearly critically important. And they, and our customers do have choice, and so it's in our interest to make sure that our pricing is is, is market priced, and um, and we work very hard to do that, and are constantly reviewing the, the market landscape to make sure that is the case. But I think the biggest single um, change is the re reduction of complexity, and retail was step one, and now aligning this new uh, nine zone structure would really help. Uh, our customer will make it much simpler for our customers and remove some of those uh, discontinuities that we saw with Minister Little with that customer uh, quad bar. Um, it will help with customers like that, remove some of those discontinuities where one lane just happens to be more from A to B, which was just an you know, consequence of simplifying retail and now getting it right for all our business customers. Question. Yeah, I'm done. Done. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Barnes, do we have you on uh, a telephone now? Uh, thank you, Senator. Is that better? That is much better. Thank you. Senator Carr. Thank you very much. So, Mr Barnes, you were assisting us in terms of the modelling. The outputs of the modelling was, uh, was the question I asked? Yes. Thank you, Senator. Uh, the alternative delivery model was one part of the temporary regulatory relief. Our aim in the model was to ensure that we could divert our uh, letter posties uh, re resource into delivering more parcels. Uh, to do that, we needed to adhere to a number of the changes in that we were not impacting regional rounds. We were not impacting PO boxes, post office mails, so they still received the daily service and PO boxes and so forth. Uh, there's 8,200 rounds across the country uh, that were uh, potentially impacted. Uh, through the, the modelling and through the, the uh, split between regional and metro, there were 6,000, uh, just over 6,000 rounds that needed to be reassessed with a view to this modelling. Pre-COVID, um, we were faced with a situation where our average post year round, which would traditionally have about uh, 1,800 to uh, 1,200 delivery points, was getting less than 500 letters in total per day for those points. And that continued to diminish. In fact, in 2014, the number of letters that we sequenced through the machines to go to posties for those rounds was up close to 1,500 letters per round. So that's just the evidence, uh, Senator, of that decline in volume. As we modelled the, uh, the rounds, of course, uh, and looking at mode, we had a number of objectives. We wanted to improve safety for our posties. We wanted to ensure that we could cover those rounds and we also needed to make sure that as we paired those rounds together to achieve the alternate day service, we took into account terrain, topography and mode of travel and also posty safety and the posty capacity to do that work. It was quite a complex process. We have a software tool and a national 
a delivery modelling tool that we use and it calculates things as the topography, the terrain, uh, the distances, the mode of travel, uh, the volume of letters on those rounds. Each round are different. Some posties have quite busy rounds and others are, are a little different of course. And that changes every month and we monitor that weekly and we also monitor that monthly. So we built the model effectively to create what we call pairs of four rounds so that what we could effectively achieve is we would have two posties who would do around a, a, a piece because most homes now are only receiving letters two to three times a week. So we had two posties covering that. The model then planned for a third postie to take the volume of parcels that was already in the existing suite of parcels that we were streaming into our postie network. We were streaming these parcels and we've been doing so since 2016 because as letters declined, uh, we were trying to find extra work for the posties to come through and counter and deal with the surging volume demand. Uh, and that's been fairly successful, but it's got to the point where those, postie, those parcels, sorry, Senator, exceeded the capacity for our posties. So in other words, on the motorcycle, there was just no more capacity to do anymore. And this demand had kept growing and we'd seen that evidence from last peak the fourth postie that uh, we could free up through the modelling was used to cope with the additional parcels. Uh, additional parcels we could stream into the postie centre. There could be parcels coming in through our other fleet, through the red van fleet or the contractor fleet, and we could work those through. Um, I can go into more detail, Senator, to help you in the modelling. If there's anything more specific, I can so, get to some of the results. Thank you. So I, and, I'm keen to, to make sure I answer your question. No, that's very good of you. Thank you. And, and I, I presume you shared this modelling with the board? Uh, I shared the modelling with the board in, in what I'll call um, quite summary terms. I did not go into the, the exact details around topography, and, and you could appreciate the very complex nature mm. of each round. So a summary was presented to the board. And what day was that? You were able to tell me that? When was that presented? I'm sorry, Senator, I have to take this. Thank you. I can't recall the exact date. Fair enough. And have you done any subsequent review of your model to measure how that uh, has worked out in practice? Uh, absolutely, Senator. In fact, part of the commitment to the workforce as we rolled the modelling out was we set up individual work groups at every one of the 131 locations impacted. Those work groups consisted of uh, nominated union delegates from the staff, health and safety representatives, management, and then the local team that worked through, shall I say, some of the desktop analysis. We were very mindful that what we put down in desktop, what we move in GPS and photography is totally different than when you get out in the real world on the real rounds. And as we've started to roll this program out and we've started to work with the staff, particularly in New South Wales and Queensland, where we've not had the same challenges, shall I say, from COVID, uh, we've seen significant improvement now coming through that. But there have been tweaks. We always said there would be tweaks. There's still more tweaks to do. Um, those states are a little bit more fortunate. They're not suffering the same level of challenge we are in Victoria. Um, but that also takes into account, Senator, people's abilities. So where we have posties who may have uh, work restrictions or they may have um, just different limits of work, they also need to be taken into account as we go through the model. Um, we've only had pro probably about three to four weeks where I would say we've had any consistent run at the model. So um, although we started rolling out in July with a couple of trial sites, most of the sites started uh, beginning an element of their delivery centre late August. So we're still very, very new into the process, but we are monitoring uh, the results on a daily basis through the scanners, uh, through the GPS data, through the service and through feedback. Uh, and I'd be happy to present that at, at some date if that helps you, Senator. Thank you very much. I, I would appreciate that. Now, the, the, I noticed that the Victorian branch of the Postal Union has raised this matter with its members uh, and has got some attention in today's press. Uh, have they raised their concerns with you about the operations of the model? Uh, Thank you, Senator. I really appreciate that question. Uh, we have our general manager for the region that deals with the Victorian Union has a scheduled meeting with the union and their officials four times a week in which they discuss all elements of issues creating around start time, uh, posty requests, challenges. It is a very challenging environment in Victoria 
Uh, we've had to split shift start times. It's been, it's been a very significant change for our posties. I do appreciate that in the history of this organisation, our last mile business and our posties have never seen so much change so quickly. You know, they've gone to doing rounds, they've changed modes, they've changed locations, they've got more parcels coming through. It has been a significant change and we do appreciate that. Uh, we've been in regular contact with the union. They've given us lots of feedback. I did note the media release uh, last night and, and that has not been raised to us specifically uh, by the union as, uh, as I checked this morning. And there were some elements in that report that, that I would appreciate to clarify because um, we, we, the safety element that was raised in that report is very concerning and we treat safety seriously. Um, there was concerns raised that posties felt the need to speed on the footpath exceeding 10 kilometres an hour. Uh, that is very concerning. That had not been raised to us previously, to my knowledge, and uh, I will address that with the union. That's a serious concern. However, uh, we have a one safe procedure in our system where we encourage and we train our staff to record hazards and risks on all of their rounds. This ranges from uh, dog, uh, dogs loose in the street, potential dog bites, to utilities, Telstra pits and, and, and communication pits that may be a risk on the run, even to a magpie zone, Senator. Um, there is not, that I could check last night, one entry in that one safe system that recognises this risk raised by posties. So uh, that to me is, is a concern. We need to work through that if that is in fact what's happening. The other thing in relation to speed, uh, specific to the EDVs, the electric three-wheelers, they have a governing device, a speed limiter, that, that if the post engages, which they're supposed to engage as policy, it restricts that speed to less than 10 kilometres, and that should be used in all cases on the footpath. We also have, and are beginning a process of rolling out telematics safety device. We have 3,800 of these units in the country today, of which there are 360 degree cameras on them and, uh, and speed recorders. They measure tilt in case the, the motorcycle or the vehicle tilts. They measure harsh acceleration, braking, speed, GPS location, all those things for safety. And we're also piloting a pro program with Google uh, Learning so that we can indicate a, post off, sorry, a footpath as opposed to a road so we could prevent such events that's been reported in that uh, media release. Um, that, uh, that uh, to the knowledge that, that we have, we have no events other than one in Darwin where we had a post on a motorcycle that we dealt with. Now, we don't use that as disciplinary procedure, we use that as educationary. The, the media report seemed to intimate that this was the, uh, the need for speed, which, which is you know, certainly unacceptable, was caused by the volume of work or the necessity for the postie to, to if you like, go faster. Um, this, this is challenging because we, every one of our posties you'd appreciate, Senator, has a scanner. That scanner is recording the number of parcels they scan. When they scan those parcels, it records a timestamp. It also records a GPS position. We can also tell whether that scanner is stationary. So we can see whether that there are, for example, breaks or there are stops, and we, we obviously give our posties permission to pause. I do take those safety um, reports seriously and I will look into those. But on the data and the information I have, there are some serious discrepancies in, yep. in what has supposedly thank been surveyed to, to what I see, Senator. Thank you, Mr Barnes. Look, I've, I've only got a limited time and the answers you're giving are quite detailed. Uh, just that I make a couple of observations. The, there is a complaint that these meetings are three to four times a week, I think you said, are really only phone calls. Uh, the other observation that's made that, as I read the advice that was tendered to the Chamber, the regulations were introduced on the basis that they were urgent, and you're just saying you've only just entered them now, and I'm wondering how we can reconcile that sense of urgency back in April with what you're now saying is you've only just entered it. Uh, now, what, what I'm being told in terms of the survey results is that eight out of ten of the members of the union are confirming that lettuce products have been left behind or undelivered for more than one business day. Nine of the ten members are confirming parcel products are left behind for more than one business day. That an overwhelming majority of members considered that the ADM had reduced service quality. Now, 
57% of traditional posties believe that letters and small parcels, that their letters-based products behind, were being left behind at the delivery centre, bought them back, and when they were remain undelivered for more than one business day, I understand there was inconsistency in the regulations. The 51% of posties, um, those the ones who undertake the traditional postal services, had left behind or bought back parcel products, including premium and express posts, and they were unable to deliver them on their run on the day the parcel was due for delivery, that an average number of parcels undelivered on that day was due was at 44. 43% of posties admitted to being unable to adhere to footpath and nature strip speed limits, as you've, you've emphasised. 84% of posties said they were unable to complete their duties within their rostered times. 34% said they were considered the level of overtime required to complete their run was unreasonable. 55% said they were unable to take the ap applicable breaks in order to complete their duties. Now, if that's the level of response from the members, I'm just wondering how that fitted, fit with your report to uh, this committee of a few moments ago. Uh, thank you, Senator. I haven't seen those all those specific um, reported survey percentages that you mentioned. However, I, I can, uh, looking at the information I've had in, in a short space of time, advise that there were some comments made around uh, the efficiency of the vehicles and that 50 per cent of the vehicles were effectively uh, deteriorating service rather than improving. The data that we have shows completely the opposite. Mm -hmm. In fact, in November 19, which was our busiest period in Victoria for delivering parcels, the posties delivered just on 2.69 million packets of parcels. In September 20, just gone, the same um, posties in Victoria have now delivered 4.02 million. So that's a significant increase with that process coming in, and that's improving on a daily basis. Um, in relation to overtime, um, there is some challenge in relation to the second starter. So because of COVID, Half of the postie workforce in Victoria are starting three to three and a half hours later per day, which seriously impacts the productivity. Uh, we've been in regular communication with the union. We know this is not popular for the posties. We know they would much prefer to start earlier. It is simply not safe for us to do so in the current environment with social distancing and those work environments. But we have embarked on a program in consultation with the union where we can on those centres bring those start time forward. Uh, we have done that and we have continued to do that at 10 locations recently. Um, I, I also note, uh, Senator, that uh, there was some talk there about um, overtime. Uh, the overtime numbers that we've seen specific to those letters posties has decreased, although we do provide overtime for the posties on weekends. Uh, we offered the union just recently some extra resource to work indoors to sort letters so we could try and help that workload. Uh, the union were opposed to that for some reason, which, which, which surprises me. We'll continue those discussions because that would also have helped those deliveries out on posties on the road. Uh, we'll have to work through that with them. Uh, in relation to all those percentages, uh, you have a limited time, Senator, so I'm guided specifically as which one you'd like me to address. but. I do struggle with those numbers, but I'm more than happy to, to deal with the union. In relation to phone calls, I do recall a face-to-face -face meeting that I attended also with Mr Lazaroy and his officials at our North Melbourne office only uh, six weeks ago. So uh, we do meet face-to-face -face where we can, and I have seen Mr Lazaroy in the office here face-to-face -face, uh, meeting with my general manager, sir. Right up. Can I, I ask... Uh... Mr Windervere, does, has the department undertaken any review of the operations of the regulations? Uh, Senator, the minister indicated that, um, that we would be um, having a look or review of the, um, of the uh, relief measures uh, during, you know, at a sort of, at a sort of midpoint. Um, so we are um, uh, in the process of uh, consulting, um, consulting with a variety of people, uh, and working, you know, having a look, in a sense, having a look at the operation of the regulatory relief at the moment. And when you say midpoint, what do you expect that? What's that date in your judgment? What does that m mean, uh, Senator? I mean, there wasn't a, there isn't a um, specific time, but I think, you know, roughly speaking, um, the end of the year, I would imagine. Mm. I mean, the regulations are due to. 
that have been yeah. brought in for temporary relief um, uh, mm -hmm. end 30 June next year? Yes. So um, you, you'd expect a review to be completed by the end of the year? I think we will have completed um, having a review of how they're, um, how they're operating in that time frame, yes. Thank you. Um, is there any possibility that these uh, emergency regulations might be uh, brought to a conclusion earlier than June next year? Uh, Senator, I don't think I could. I mean, I suppose all I could say at the moment, the um, plan would be that the regulations will um, continue as uh, originally made and intended through to the 30th of June, but obviously um, that that decision could be altered, but at this point, I, I, you know, the, the regulations are as they are. Yes, as I they appreciate they are as they are until they're not as they are. Um, it's the, it's just that the, the feedback that we're receiving is that the ADM model, it's not working the way that the modelling was going to suggest it would be. Uh, it's being suggested that the mail service has actually deteriorated, not improved. Uh, there's been a reduction in the efficiency of parcel delivery, smaller parcels, ordinary delivered by postals, posties on motorcycles and EDVs have been shifted to van delivery and the van drivers simply cannot deliver those parcels as quickly as the posties, uh, because the, you know, in terms of the, the, the you know, they're taking advantage of the footpaths. Uh, and that's clearly the view that's coming through the survey results from the unions. Um, is there any dispute to that uh, view within the department? Uh, Senator, I don't have any, I, I can't yeah. comment on and haven't, I haven't seen so the, you don't, you the any... results you're talking about. I mean, the, one, the, the point I would make is I think behind the, the regulatory relief was um, designed and intended to provide um, the Australia, Australia Post with some flexibility yeah. in how it organised its operations in these times and enable it to um, work out how best to mm. deliver um, services for Australians, and I think what we've heard from Australia Post is they're obviously working working on that. The re, the um, uh, there's so the um, I mean I suppose the point I would make is that the regulatory relief gives them that op operational flexibility, but then it is up to Australia Post, and they are working through how best to op um, to use their workforce and organise their um, workforce. Uh, within the constraints of the yeah. reg regulation and within the operational yeah, constraints yeah, I, they face. Except that, what, that proposition that you're putting. So, um, as Holgate, the proposition I've just outlined, you, you, do you dispute that specifically smaller parcels, ordinarily delivered by posties on motorcycles uh, and so on? Senator, as we've gone into um, coronavirus, it's not just the number of parcels, it's the size and weight. and. Um, that is actually, you can't carry many large parcels on the back of a motorbike. So that, I do personally, just listening to you, find that slightly confusing. We have a very close relationship with the union. And if I may, I'd like to pass to my colleague here, because we regularly talk to them about the rollout of ADM. Sue does very regularly, and I do on occasion too. Thank you. Uh... Um, Senator Susan Davis, EGM of uh, People and Culture. Um, since we uh, had our Senate inquiry, um, you're obviously aware that we, uh, we signed up to a memorandum of understanding with the, uh, the CPU. Um, and, and what that's done is, is outlined how we would approach the implementation of ADM. And, We've had extensive consultation um, at national level with the national president and the national secretary. We continue to have that uh, consultation. And I think as Mr. Barnes has, has pointed out, the, it's, it's not just ADM. The timing of, of ADM was the same time as we uh, encountered just phenomenal um, volumes in, in our parcels side of the business. Um, as, as the CEO has pointed out, um, one of the things that, that we have worked really hard on, and this has been a significant change for our employees, and we do accept that and we do acknowledge that, and we've done everything to help people transition through that. One of the key things for us is that we've done that in a safe way. 
Um, as, as the CEO points out, we, we cannot simply carry uh, parcels and, and the larger parcels on, on the back of a, a, a motorbike. Yeah, sure. So, um, but you know, the, the, the consultation has been extensive, and I will say that with the uh, um, the president and the national secretary, we, we've worked really hard. Um, and in New South Wales and Queensland, we've made exceptional uh, progress. There are things that we do need to work through without question. Um, and there's, there's things that we, we, we need to refine. Um, I know that the, I spoke with the National Secretary and President last night, and obviously we weren't aware of the survey, and it, it's representative, it's 400 posties, and we, we've obviously got 12,000 posties out there, and we've got 2,500 posties who immediately signed an expression of interest to say they wanted to transition to vans. Sure. So I, I think the, you know, we continue to work through this process and without question we will refine this. It's been such a change for our employees and you know as Mr Barnes pointed out, navigating through coronavirus with a workforce of an extended workforce and an actual workforce of eighty thousand people, with the restrictions in Victoria particularly, where we've had two thirds of our workforce working for a number of weeks, has been extremely problematic and, and difficult, and we fully understand that that's been difficult for uh, our employees, specifically in, in Victoria. Um, with the training, uh, and again, I want to emphasise from a safety perspective, there's nothing more important to us than the safety of our employees. So, that's, I, I, I hope that that is, in fact, reiterated throughout the organisation. But so, have, are you finding that it because of this change in the work patterns that you've had to actually employ more contractors? No, we've actually employed, um, we've taken on, you, you may have seen the campaign now that we have leading up to Christmas. So on top of coronavirus, so at the, the, let's call it the COVID period, we took on an additional 900 um, employees to help service our customers throughout that period. Leading up to Christmas, we will take on an additional 4,000 employees and potentially 5,000 employees. And they'll be employees direct employees, will they? Sorry? Direct employees rather than contractors? Absolutely, but casuals, but direct yeah, casuals. casuals, okay. Yes. And is it true that contractors are actually paying double the ordinary price rate to get the parcels uh, delivered? Is there any truth to that? No. Uh, no. 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 Not, to our not to our knowledge. Not to our knowledge. Would you like to take that on notice? If, we'll take you, that if, on notice. if there's any hesitation, I yeah, suggest we'll you take, take that on notice. notice. Yeah, um, we'll take that on notice. Uh, so, so, uh, do you mind if I just make a clarification to on behalf of the, the Minister? Yes. Um, so that the Minister for Communications has in fact written to representatives of the Australian Post Workforce yes. and to also to licensee, licensed um, post office yeah. franchisees to large and small businesses and also to the print industry um, seeking views on that regulatory relief. And um, obviously there's a review underway and then we wouldn't want to sort of preempt the results of that review or speculate on the outcomes, but, um, but the government will finalise those results by the end of the year. Uh, do, we, do we have a copy of the letter? I don't know whether it's one letter or whether it's been a phone we, call or what it looks like. I, I, just say, know I been thought you used the word written to. Oh, no, you're absolutely right. I did use the word written to. You're yes. absolutely right. No? So would I, could we have a copy of the letter, please? Oh, I can take that on notice. Thank you very much. Um, I understood he's had constructive uh, meetings with those uh, various groups. That's that what led me to ask the question whether or not it's an issue of whether or not there is going to be uh, a possibility of bringing the regulations to an end more quickly, uh, given there are some concerns being expressed uh, as I understand it, and, put that, and I understand that view might well have been put directly to the Minister. Uh, now, uh, can I ask, is it the case that um, we've got posties that are actually resigning from their jobs at ADM sites since the model's been introduced? Is that, we had, do we have any, any numbers on terms of so, uh, staff uh, turnover? Yeah, so um, I'm very happy to provide some uh, detailed attrition numbers. Mm -hmm. What we've actually seen through COVID-19 is, is the attendance mm -hmm. has increased significantly mm -hmm. across the whole business, in mm -hmm. particular um, in our frontline employees. 
um, the amount of, of post is retiring during that period has actually reduced significantly. Mm -hmm. We obviously have a, an ageing so, workforce. So retirements are down. Um, retirements are down yeah. um, and, and attrition is, is certainly uh -huh. not increasing. And so um, you've and you'll have statistics too. Can you can you provide us with any statistical advice on that? I can I can Thank take you. that on notice. And point. do you have um, any advice on sick leave and workers' we, comp issues in regard to we, the operations of the regulations or in this period? We do, Senator. Yeah. We, what are, what we, are they telling you? So again, the uh, the sick leave. What I can confirm for you is, as I've just said, during the. Uh, the peak times of COVID, May, um, March, April, May, June, our attendance actually increased. So people were taking less sick leave, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, mm -hmm. and again, that was commendable for our frontline employees. Right. People well, wanted to serve Australia and people continue to work through uh, the COVID crisis. Thank so. you. Can I turn to the issue of the um, unaddressed mail service? Is it the case that Australia Post has been considering suspending or scaling back uh, UMS. Senator, I will pass to my colleague, Mr Starr, at the moment. We were asked by some um, of our posties, they wrote to me and asked me to consider whether we would consider restricting what they called as non-essential unaddressed mail in Victoria while we had the lockdown. Um, I'll pass my colleague, Mr Starr, in a moment, but as you'll be aware, Senator, we have just undergone, or we're actually just very currently supporting um, an election in Victoria, and we are actively um, using unaddressed mail for political marketing um, in the state. I don't know, Gary, if you'd like to add anything. I would. I'm going to add a few things, but I'll just be clear. You, so you are considering this issue, or you've been requested to consider this issue. What's the what's the nature of your response? For my, for myself personally, um, Senator Carr, several posties wrote to me and asked me whether I would consider doing it, and it was on that basis that I went back to my team. But I know that Mr. Starr is right across this, so he'd be able to give you a more accurate and full response. Yes. There is a... I'm more than happy to take advice from the relevant executive, but in terms of your response as the CEO, uh, I take it a decision will have to be made by you. Is that the case, or is there an executive decision made exclusively by the, the executive officer that you're now drawing our attention to? No, if we, um, if we decided to stop all unaddressed marketing in Victoria, for example, then that would be something that we would do as a whole team in consultation with the departments. It wouldn't be just something that we roll out and do. It's not how we operate. We work very closely, actually, with the unions. And yeah. just to give you some assurance, um, Mr Greg Rayner actually sits on our safety council where we have board members also sitting on it. So he is a direct voice to be able to reflect any concerns he has direct to the board. So are, are you having problems with delivering unaddressed mail? Is there a, is this, can we get a yes or no to that proposition? S Senator Carr, we have had significant challenges in Victoria delivering. You know, we have to work, well, we now actually, with the support of the Victorian government, got release on one of those restrictions. But the second restriction, which is the four metre rule, which means that we're only allowed to have a split shift of posties. Second postie comes in, we have to clean the premises. Second postie comes in, he cannot work for an extended sure. period of time. Sure. So when you have a volume, but you have significantly less workforce, mm -hmm. yes, we have challenges. All right, OK. So you have you've notified businesses you can't deliver their unaddressed mail? We haven't, we haven't said we can't deliver. We've talked to some of our customers of non-essential and said, 
would you support us at this moment in time? Do you need to do this? And we're just actively in consultation. But it would be misleading of me to, um, to answer Senator more fully when I know that Mr. Starr has actually been a key person leading this in the company. Okay. Uh, but I'm just trying to get... I appreciate that you're asking for more specific uh, advice to be provided to the committee, uh, and we'll take that if you can, but, um, and I might come back to you, because there is there's a policy question that comes to this issue, not just an administrative or technical question about uh, the regulations in Victoria. So ha have you had to notify businesses that you will not be able to deliver their mail? So, uh, may, would it be appropriate for me to respond, Senator Carr? The answer is no. Was that the answer? No, he asked if it was appropriate. Sorry, no, I asked if it would be appropriate for me to respond because I was, I, it's hard for me to tell to whom you're addressing the question. Is it Sorry. okay if Mr. Gary if I respond? Yeah, well, please do. Uh, so, so, we are continuing the service, Senator. Um, we have um, in Victoria. We are working with a partner to deliver commercial unaddressed mail um, due to the restrictions, um, because you know, we, as 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 you're aware and we've mentioned, the restrictions have made it extremely challenging just here in Victoria. Um, but we are constantly looking at the portfolio, and we're in consultation with customers okay. um, around. Uh, thank you. I've got. You, I know we're, that's the CEO has told me that you have trouble, and and you're you know you've got these challenges. So. I'll go back to Ms Holgate. Have you advised businesses that you can't deliver their mail? I do not believe we said we cannot deliver your mail. We have spoken to business customers, Senator, and asked for their support about whether it's really important that we do some of the unaddressed marketing at this moment in time when we've had these restrictions. This was at the request of our workforce, and we take these requests seriously. Address your workforce. You, you, you've had it. letters from posties. Is that the nature of the? This I've is how you're had, measuring that. I had communication from posties to ask whether we would consider um, looking at unaddressed mail at this moment in time. Okay. How many posties have, set, have written to you to stop the delivery of unaddressed mail? They haven't asked to stop the delivery of unaddressed mail. What they've asked for for non-essential unaddressed mail to be considered. And in fact, if I may, Senator, we have discussed this with the unions to seek their point of view. Isn't mm. that correct, Ms Davis? That's correct. And uh, Senator, we, uh, again, we've discussed the, uh, with the union who have also raised um, that, you know, as we, we do move forward, then uh, posties have re or the members have raised with uh, the union that uh, the unaddressed mail is, uh, is something that they want to look at as we move forward. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me what's the revenue generated by unaddressed mail? I'd have to take it on notice, but just to give you a small reflection, it's about 20% of our volumes and of our volumes on average of our terms of revenue, um, it'd be about, t I'd have to, if I could confirm this later on notice, it'd be about 10 to 15% of the value, so it's considerably less. But it is often um, it's significant. quite restricting. It is less. significant? No, less. Sorry, of 20% of volume, 10 to 15% of revenue? No, 10 to 15% of overall. So if you have a BPR at $1.10, mm -hmm. it'd be about 10 to 15% of that. I see. So uh, what uh, is the total revenue to Australia Post? of unaddressed mail in the last, the last figure you've got? If I may pass to the CFO, he will have that figure to hand. Mr Rodney Boyce. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Rodney Boyce, uh, Chief Financial Officer of Australia Post. The revenue for unaddressed mail uh, last year was $58.5 million. And what was your profit again? 53 profit before tax. Yeah, I see. Uh, so it is significant. It's, it's a very important service, 
and we do not want to stop and address mail. We're literally trying to respond to the um, quest for more employees to look at things which could ease our burden in Victoria while we're on lockdown. We have just done quite a large campaign of an address mail in Victoria to support the election. Yes, I understand that. Uh, and I'm going to come to that in some detail, but I just want to be clear about this. Has the future of unaddressed mail post January 2021 been addressed by an Australian board meeting? We have no more than that we see it as an important service and we will continue it. Okay, now has this matter been discussed at a recent board meeting? Not to my recollection, but if I may take it on notice, mm -hmm. Senator Carr. Mm -hmm. With a view, I mean, the concerns being expressed, the, the purpose of that conversation was about its future, conversation about its future. Senator Carr, unaddressed mail is a really important part mm -hmm. of our service offering. We are right at this moment you know, supporting the Queensland elections and yeah. the Victoria elections. Yes, yes. I'm and we don't want to lose unaddressed mail. Mm -hmm. We literally want to try and find ways that we can help our people while they've got these lockdown restrictions. I personally have a meeting with Mr Rob Barnes, with the Treasurer of Victoria, every fortnight. Mm -hmm. And we talk through our issues and discuss different ways of things that we can look at to mm -hmm. help ensure we can improve our deliveries in Victoria. Okay, so is, has it been the case that uh, the Print and Visual Communications Association or any other industry peak body has raised with you concerns about the future of the UMS service and what they've described to me as a 350 million dollar industry and the thousands of jobs that actually depend upon it? Not to myself, um, Senator, and you know, on occasion I do actually meet with the print industry. Um, Gary and myself have met many of the different leaders. So you've not been approached by uh, any of the unions about this matter? Not to, my, not to my knowledge, Senator. I'd have to take it on notice. Senator Carter. So when you uh, consulted the union, what were you consulting them about? We asked them their views, the feedback that we've been hearing, that the some of the posties uh, in Victoria had asked for non-essential non -essential marketing so, mail. See, you were asking them whether or not they needed to continue non-essential. Is that, have I understood you correctly? Non-essential direct I asked, mail. I asked the unions whether we'd heard this feedback, and I asked them, was that feedback consistent with what they were hearing? And they wanted their point of view about what was important. I see. So these letters you received from a couple of posties, was it a couple? It was a few posties, and phone calls. Phone calls. How many? I cannot recall the mm -hmm. exact number, Senator Carr. And it was sufficient number for you to write this matter with the CPSU as to the, and, and presumably the print elements of the ANWU as to the future of unaddressed mail. Senator, every morning at 9.30, as an executive team, we meet. My colleague, Mr. Rob Barnes, I shared with him the feedback that we'd heard. He spoke to his people and it was very similar feedback. I would like it, Chair, I would really like it to be noted, we support unaddressed mail. We do not want to get rid of this service. It's a very important part of our portfolio. So can I ask, uh, Minister, uh, has your, the minister you represent had representations from the Print and Visual Communication Association or any of the other peak bodies, including unions, have they had any representations concerning the future of unaddressed mail services? I'm sorry, Senator, you have to repeat that question. Yes, uh, has the, the Minister had any representation from the Print and Visual Communications Association 
or any other peak industry bodies, including unions, uh, Regarding concerning mail. the future of unaddressed mail service. Not that I'm aware of, but I'm happy to take that on notice. Thank you very much. Carl, with that, it's um, now past the time for the morning break. So we will break for 15 minutes, uh, come back at 10.45 and uh, resume examination of the Australia Post. Thank, Thank you. you.
Okay, the committee will resume, and Senator Carr, you have the call. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, Minister, have we had an opportunity to establish whether or not there has been any communications uh, or any representations from the Print and Visual Communications Association? No, I'd have said I'll take, you take that on notice, right Senator on. Carr. Okay. Uh, the, uh, Ms. Holcott, I'm wondering whether or not the problem with UMS is really a question that it, it affects the capacity of actually to be able to deliver letters on time rather than essential, the nature of essential um, mail. Is that the case? It, it undermines the model for the uh, the emergency regulations. Senator Carr, as I hope to have explained, we have been dealing with significant volumes and it was a consideration on non-essential UMS. UMS is a really important business to us. We don't want to get rid of it. And as I explained earlier, I personally have been working very closely with the Victorian government. We are hopeful that further restrictions will come soon, be released, I should um, okay. say apologies, Chair. And when they are, apologies then we, it will make our life considerably easier for us, our workforce and our customers. Right on. So in regard to priority letters, uh, the, uh, has there been a change in policy in regard to priority mail? As I recall, the initial position was that you couldn't guarantee the priority mail service. One of the things that we put in, put in place, we can't guarantee the delivery standards. As I believe you're aware, Senator, there is significant restrictions currently. You know, Qantas is still operating at 20%. We have challenges with the bus companies and the trains, and we could not meet those timetable, and it'd be misleading for us to say we could. The team have put in place a substitute product to be able to help people where they really were dependent on that service. And that's one extra day, if I recall correctly. But I may ask my colleague, um, Mr. Starr, just to either affirm or correct that. Uh, thank you, uh, Christine. Yes, um, as, as, as um, Christine has mentioned, we, uh, the suspension of priority service was made to accommodate expected you know, the reduction in workforce availability, context of the challenges that we saw the pandemic and flights and greyhound buses and transport routes and so on. We, all, we set up an alternate priority timetable, which is still in place, um, which is effectively one extra day, um, as has already been stated. Um, and we are seeing customers use that service still. Uh, we are seeing customers that have chosen to move to regular service and that is meeting their needs. But we're working very closely with all, all those larger, the bulk mailers, with all our larger mail customers to meet their needs. Thank you. But I understand you're actually using a priority service for the postal ballot uh, for the Victorian local government elections. That's the case, isn't it? Uh, that, that is correct, yes. So all the municipalities in Victoria, minus three, um, are actually undertaking elections at the moment. Have they all used the priority mail service? Well, it's the, the Electoral Commission. So, Senator, thanks for the question. The, uh, we have been meeting regularly with the Commissioner and his team, and they, um, in terms of the lodgement, um, working closely with Mr Barnes, we, they lodged uh, the 4.3 million um, packs into the network, and they're, on, they're currently on their way back. Um, we're meeting again this afternoon with the commissioner, uh, the mm -hmm. and I, um, and there will progress with the returns. And um, at our last call, uh, for, I, I forget, Christine, which day it was, but a few days ago or Friday, they were comfortable with the progress to date, and we expect and hope that they will be today too, but we'll meet with them this afternoon to ensure that we sort of meet, meet the expectations mm -hmm. of the VEC. In fact, they have to be back. This, when, when, what's the closure date Friday for the return of balance? Uh, Friday the 23rd of October, uh, yes, right. tomorrow. And, um, you know, we've worked very closely. As you'd imagine, there's meticulous planning for elections across the country because we have had Eden Monaro and 
NT and, and now playing for Queensland. And Mr Barnes is, you know, we've, we've worked with our operations teams to add extra street, uh, street pitching box collections to make sure that uh, the return votes are received yes. in time, you know, so in the prescribed time. Frame. How many items were involved in that, uh, in that Victorian local government election? Uh, I, may, I, I believe, and Mr Barnes can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, there were 4.3 million uh, voting packs to go out, I believe. 4.3 million? Yes. I see. And, and you anticipate you'll be able to meet that timetable? Uh, so they went out uh, on the, I think, the 8th, 9th and 10th of October, Senator, or, you know, earlier on, and um, all the votes that have been they bought into the mm -hmm. households. Um, and there are invariably one or two that don't get there, but there are reprints and there are projects around that that's very standard and been in place for many years. And so we've worked very closely with them and have daily reporting. And now we're very focused on the return. So now that all the but the, post, the packs have been have arrived with the voter, it's now down to voters returning those packs. What's the return what's a normal delivery time in Victoria? For a mail item, a post, a priority paid mail item. Could I clarify? Um, so I, I have to, yeah. Could I clarify, Sorry. Senator? Is that without um, without any temporary regulatory relief, or with temporary regulatory relief? No. To, you've spent 4.3 million ballot papers are being delivered by priority pay. What's the, how long does it take to post a, to have a letter sent in Victoria to deliver to the AEC for those elections? Gary, Victoria's might... not a big place, so we should be able to work that out. Before the temporary... Sorry, sorry. No, now. Th this election, this is due Today's tomorrow. The mail's due tomorrow. How long does it take? If you deliver, a, if you send, a, if send a priority pay letter in Victoria, how long does it take to be delivered? So we, so um, it would depend on the location, Senator. But it would this your turn of priority timetable um, includes an extra day to deliver the priority uh, a priority mail, an extra day on the regular service. And we're now talking about the return the reply paid mm -hmm. letters, not the law firms that have all arrived. Right. So, what's, what's this from? can you tell me how many days that is? Senator, it's Rob Barnes. Uh, if I can address your question, please. Yes, the, um, we made special arrangements with the mailing house in particular for the elections to pre-sequence those letters so we're able to process them in our machines much quicker. That's a common arrangement with large mailings like this when we plan those with the local government bodies. So those letters came through our processing centre and they were done in three days. Um, I Three expect days. that for the okay. items to come back from most parts of Victoria, we should be fine within three to four days. Senator. Okay, thank you. And what's, uh, what's the cost structure? What's the difference in the cost structure? Uh, uh, priority mail is a 50, uh, 50, sorry, 50 cent uh, uh, charge on top of the regular uh, right. uh, basic postage so, rate. So on top of a standard level delivery charge? Yes. Thank you. Yes. And the in the Queensland election, I take it you're using priority paid facilities there. So for for, for Queensland, um, there it is. This is in Victoria. It's a purely postal vote. In Queensland, um, it is a in, one can vote in person. There will be some postal votes. Um, and I do believe, I'd have to clarify that, Senator, but I do believe they would be using the priority service. Our focus today has been on the planning, which we started many months ago, but I, I can confirm that, take that notice and confirm. Right, so you don't have an estimate of the numbers that are involved? Well, again, it's, it's down to the, the voter. Yeah, the number of applications. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah so, you know, we have, well, I, do, I do, Senator, so as of, I don't have the latest figures, but the, light, the figures that I saw was at about, I think it was just uh, just under 900,000 uh, Queenslanders had elected to receive a postal voting pack. Um, Thank you. Which, which well, is quite high. How, yeah, how old was that? Sorry, how old was that estimate? It was last night. Last Senator. night. So 900 as of last night. And I 
recall correctly, um, Gary, that's a multiple of previous years. Yeah. Yes, it's up, six, it's up way up, uh, that correct, and um, it, it actually is about a quarter of the voting public in Queensland. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, so, okay. is it true, though, that therefore the priority mail has in fact been reinstated? It is not uh, true. No, I, so, thank you, Senator. No, I would say that we've, it, it hasn't been reinstated. We have, we have set up an alternate priority service as Mr Barnes mentioned, and by working closely with the bulk mailers, um, we're able to uh, process very expediently, as, as was explained, so that um, knowing exactly if it's all sequenced and exactly when we receive it, and that's unlike someone going to the post office and posting a letter with a priority sticker on it, so that process is so the, more the, ma the, the, manually intensive yeah. and done. And, and, but and, we can manage it with anything over 300 units, so 300 mail pieces, we can manage it effectively. But it does appear to be uh, for over 5 million mail items, a priority service for over 5 million mail items. Uh, that's, well, for, for these, the elections that you're referring to, yes, to date, to date. Thank you. Uh, and I'll put a question on notice in regard to some other matters. I just need to move quickly. You indicated that in terms of the procurement issue that you've uh, had uh, some discussions with regard to the purchase of Australian-made electric uh, tricycles. That's correct, Senator. Can you just indicate briefly, uh, have you managed to secure an MOU in regard to those? Rod will have um, a better update than me on that, but Rod and I did have a meeting with them. We did um, also have a couple of Rod's team and Rod, because clearly they're in Victoria, go and meet with them, do a trial of the product. And I know you were very close, Rod, last week, but do you have a better update? Yes, thank you, Christine. Senator, I can confirm with just, I guess, respect to the commercial confidentiality of the business in question, we have a jointly signed letter of intent to work through a, a proposal to trial a number of vehicles. Um, that was signed two days ago, uh, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to making okay. those uh, well, I'll put those. I'll, given, given that, I'll put some questions on notice in that regard, because time's escaping us. Can I turn to the issue of what's uh, known as the Pauline Henson stubby holders? Um, w when did the Australia Post become aware of the issue of 114 stubby holders uh, being delivered uh, in Melbourne? Uh, Rod. Rod Barnes, I can... Can I ask the CEO... I'm going to ask the CEO these questions. Would given you... Would these, you Yes, no, there, uh, there was an issue of uh, 114 stubby holders uh, with Pauline, Senator P Pauline Hanson's uh, face uh, being delivered um, uh, in, in Melbourne. Are you, are you aware of this issue? I am aware of the issue. Yes. Uh, when, were you, uh, uh, when were you made aware of the issue? One of our employees wrote to me on the Friday evening I did not see that email until the Saturday morning. So Saturday, was this the 11th of July? That's correct. Thank you. Um, who, who uh, so Mr. Mc, this is Mr. McDonald sent you an email, is that correct? No, it was not. It was um, a colleague in the organisation further down. I also received a call from Mr. Starr and a call from Mr. Barnes. I see. Uh, and is, at what point did you contact the Melbourne City Council? I personally um, didn't write to them. It was Mr McDonald who did. What I did do was because I started to receive different messages. Um, I was informed, Senator, that the Mayor, um, Ms Sally Cap, would be calling me. And because I had different people calling me, I asked us all could we join a call and really find out what was happening. I see. Look, um, I mean, I can provide the email here if necessary. I'm just uh, on notice, presumably, uh, or it may be better to get the official uh, emails rather than 
rely on my um, versions of them, which may not be accurate. But uh, so, in fact, you can provide a copy of the emails on notice. Uh, Ms. Uh, Holgate, uh, at any point did you find it necessary to speak to Senator Hanson or members of her office about the delivery? I didn't, Senator. I did wonder whether somebody should, because, you know, I was told that Ms. Sally Cap, who's somebody I know personally very well, that she would be calling me. Sally actually didn't call me, and actually as the day progressed, I think we found a resolution with Melbourne City Council. There was no need to do anything about it further than that. So you, you didn't contact uh, um, the Australian Federal Police or Vic Police about the issue? Not me personally, Senator. Mm. But if we could allow Mr Rob Barnes to talk, he'd be able to give you a much better so indication. Mr Barnes, uh, you were able to assist me. Who, who contacted the police about the delivery of the stubby holders? Uh, thank you, Senator. I became aware of the issue just after 6 p.m. on Friday, where, as Christine points out, I uh, was copied on an email to her inferring that the Mayor of the Council was about to contact her. Uh, that night on Friday, I made inquiries through our Head of Security, uh, Mr Cicado, and his team, because we had had a verbal advice that the Council had informed us that they, in fact, had referred the matter to the Federal Police. Uh, at this point, we didn't have any facts or details of what had occurred, and we were busily trying to gather those. Um, I believe that our security team, uh, particularly our head of security, who was ex a high member of the Federal Police, uh, made a request to the Federal Police to confirm the nature of the inquiry and what the concerns were. Uh, that was not forthcoming, so I need to take a notice as to who was speaking with the police, but we did later receive confirmation on the Saturday afternoon that they had received an inquiry, Senator. So, uh, the Federal Police uh, had what received an inquiry from, from where? I believe it was from the Melbourne City Council. I see. Um, and the Melbourne Age claimed at the time that it was necessary for Australia Post to notify its customer of the delivery delay. Was that correct? Uh, I'm not sure on that report, Senator. What I can say is that um, on the sender, uh, when I started to investigate the consignment on the Friday, the delivery had been attempted as early as the Wednesday, and it was a very chaotic situation. Um, the second attempt went through finally after uh, making sure that all mail, this was not just about 114, 104 items, uh, we had over 300 articles and building uh, for those towers, so all of the mail needed to be delivered. Our first attempt on the Wednesday, we were not comfortable with the security of the mail, which included these packages. So we returned them back for further advice so we could ensure with the necessary authorities that they could be delivered. You'd appreciate, Senator, that was a very um, a quick and tense situation there that the authorities and police were dealing with. Uh, as we worked through this, we delivered the articles on the Thursday. We were getting inquiries through our government sales team in Queensland from the office of the sending party as to the nature of those deliveries. Also, as the deliveries are in some cases referred to an address, if those receivers are registered in our, uh, parcel, uh, our message post service, they can receive a text message to say that a parcel is coming. So we were also getting reports that some of the residents were expecting parcels and where were they? And we were merely just trying to follow through on that. I see. So, so let me go back through this. You've got 300 items. This is delivered to the flats in Melbourne, right? This is the, the high-rise uh, flats num in Melbourne? A, a number of addresses, Senator, not just Canning Street. Right. So the addresses, whereabouts are these addresses? Uh, they are the units of about four of the buildings which relate to the towers, Senator. Right, so the units around the flats, are they? Uh, they're in the high-rise flats and each, uh, each flat, I believe, has a unit number. Right, but they're in that vicinity in North Melbourne, is that the case? They're in, they were specific to the towers that were locked down, right. Senator. Right, so the locked down towers, there were 300 items. At least that. These were okay. letters for all residents and parcels. So th they were individually addressed items, were they? Yes, they were. OK, so individually to each flat? Yes. A stubby holder? 
I don't know what was inside the packages, Senator. Well, I saw one image on pic, the Friday, we've got pictures, one what purports stubby holder, to be pictures but I can't of it. That, that was in the package. A stubby holder, uh, a, a beer stubby holder. I saw a photograph allegedly from the council on the Friday evening that to me looked like a beer stubby holder yesterday. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Now, the 300 items, were they all from uh, Senator Hanson? No, Senator. There was uh, approximately 104 items consigned from the office uh, of One Nation, not necessarily Senator Hanson. I see. But they're all from One Nation or Senator Hanson? I couldn't confirm that, Senator. I don't know who, who actually uh, sent them. OK. So uh, the complaints to the... or well, the issues you... Let's go through that with me. There was an office in Queensland the, what was the nature of that uh, inquiry? The items had been consigned express post and paid express post as a uh, would, would normally be a mixed business day service or second day. Um, and they were inquiring as to whether the items had been delivered because there were no scanned, no delivery scan coming through on those articles. That's nice. quite normal for us to receive inquiries of that nature for that service. Um, and we were obviously unable to affect that delivery due to the challenges at that centre. So individually addressed items, you did say individually addressed, did you not? I believe they were all addressed to the householder to oh, the specific right. I see. So this is a, a case of this... Uh, this, this is... Uh, I was just discussing this question of unaddressed mail. It's not properly addressed mail, it's... To the household. You didn't have any trouble delivering those mail, that mail. Senator, I do not regard that as unaddressed mail. It was uh, specifically so addressed to, 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 to the householder. Address. Unaddressed mail does not have a unit number or a address number on it. It's literally a pamphlet. I see. So unaddressed does not have an address on it. Okay. So they have a uh, uh, individual address, but not an addressee. So every flat name was n was numbered. Is that what you're saying? I to didn't see all of the 104 articles, but of the examples that I saw, uh, which was three, Senator, they were addressed to a householder at a specific unit number at a specific address. Well, what interests me is that on a question on notice on the Future Australia Post delivery service on the 29th of July, we were told the delivery of mail has on some occasions been delayed to the management competing priorities, including support Australia Post workforce through the impacts of the pandemic, for example, to accommodate both the planned and unplanned staff leave during the pandemic period and related uncertainties, while supporting all applicant, applicable service commitments, including those applicable to our parcel and express post services. Such delays, however, have not, to Australia's post knowledge, have prevented timely delivery of affected mail. So here we have a stubby holder from Senator Hanson. Didn't meet that criteria, did it? Sorry, Senator, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure of your question. The, well, the deliveries that we were engaged to perform letters and parcels from an, a wide range of senders around Australia going into those towers, uh, we started having difficulty from the Monday prior and we worked through with the centre. So I'm not certain that the nature of the circumstances of the tower, uh, you could necessarily relate that to the overall service of Australia Post. I see. So I'm just interested to know why the police are involved. Uh, I don't know why the council felt the need to involve the police either, Senator, but that's what we were informed. Yeah. So uh, the did you raise these concerns with Senator Hanson at any point? I did not speak at all to anyone at the uh, One Nation office. One Nation office. Who in One Nation's office? I did not speak to Senator Hanson. I did not speak to the senders. I believe all those matters were dealt with by our sales team in Queensland from the sending office. I don't know the individual, but we could certainly that's of interest to look at that. I see. So in the public commentary, there's been a link between this issue and the tour of the Brisbane parcel facility by Senator Hanson. Was that the... Was there a connection? None whatsoever. Just coincidence? 
it was coincidence. I see. Thank you very much. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Kitching, I believe you are seeking the call. I'm sorry, Mr Chairman, I've got another committee. Thank you, Chair. I feel like, do I need to do a sound check? No, you are sounding you just no, fine. No. Please proceed. Thank you. Um, Ms Holgate, could I turn briefly to the Bank at Post service? Are you able to provide an update on how the implementation of this project is going and whether most of the IT changes needed to support the service have been made? Thank you. Um, the service has actually proven itself to be critical, particularly um, with restrictions happening and in Victoria, because as you'll know better than me, Senator, many Victorians have been in a five kilometre rule and bank branches have been closed. On the IT part, I will ask um, Nicole Sheffield, who runs and responsible for our um, post office network, and she'll be able to give you a much more informed update. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kitching. Nicole Sheffield, um, Community and Consumer. Yes, the, we're very pleased with the Bank at Post service and how that is rolling out across our post office network. In terms of the um, security, the IT, the um, upgrade of um, the internet that has happened in over 1,300 outlets in the last 12 months, and we've, been ta we've taken on board all of the costs associated with that, so no LPOs are paying for their technology. We are now covering those costs for them, as well as obviously the benefits they're getting from the increase in volume of transactions, particularly during COVID, where we saw a number of bank branches, particularly in regional and rural Australia, close. And so it was the reliance on the post office and that bank at post service that really mattered during that. And we're very proud of the fact that 99.6% of our outlets, both CPOs and corporates and licensees, remained open and continue to remain open during this time. Okay. Um, is it possible to get a breakdown of the increased, increased number in the transactions? Yes, we can provide that. Senator, Thank you. if we may take it on notice, we can give you the ov sure. overall yeah. volumes. It's just that we can't release confidential information no, no. from a bank. No, no, I, I just overall volumes is, is good. Could I ask, and you've touched on uh, Victoria or perhaps Melbourne, uh, having different circumstances. But what usage trends are you seeing for the service and how did those trends, they held up over the COVID-19 period? So you've had an increase. So if I can get some detail just on notice, uh, just about whether that's trended, how has that happened in Victoria? Is it possible I can get it a breakdown by postcode? Uh, we can definitely provide it per state and we can provide it per okay. postcode. We probably couldn't provide it per outlet because of that um, information being yeah. confidential no, no, no. to that outlet. But I can, I can say confidently that we have seen, even though there's been a reduction in cash, um, over this time, largely because of COVID concerns about cash, uh, we have seen transaction volumes been volatile, absolutely volatile, but they have been, they've remained consistent. And Senator. And you, uh, yes, Ms. Holden. Sorry. Holden. sorry. Holden. You may be interested to know that what we've also seen is that on Thursdays, the usage of the service yeah. spikes. Yes, I can. Yes. Pre so is that the, the, is that people withdrawing? What is that on the Thursday? What is, what's the bulk of the transaction? Well, that's usually the day that um, a lot of um, pension payments are paid, um, job seeker, yes. job keeper payments. Many are actually withdrawing cash. Many are paying bills. So we also see an increase in our post bill pay product on that day. Um, many are transferring money to family in other states, um, overseas. There's a number of different transactions and they do vary, but we definitely see a spike on that day. Are you still charging a few dollars per, um, when, when someone pays a bill, for example, a utility bill, is Ospro still charging a few dollars per bill not to, not to the Not to the customer. So the, 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 the 
uh, the bill. The, the yes, the, so the, it, it depends on the the client, if you like. So yeah. not not Senator, the consumer. We could we could um, provide to the um, committee, if you would like, a sort of overview of what consumer charges are within the post mm. office. That, that I would really like that because I went to a meeting of uh, older Australians in regional Victoria and some of them are $30 a month in order to pay by at Australia Post. That it's just depending on how many utility bills they're paying. Senator, um, I, I am aware, I don't know about the $30, I am aware that um, some of our banking partners when people use our services, they charge their customers quite variable yeah. amounts. That's right. Yeah, and so, so thirty dollars in toto. So it would be anywhere from three dollars to five dollars per utility, depending on how many bills you might have. So if you're paying your Telstra plus a gas bill plus an electricity, but you know it just depends on how many bills you're paying. But some pensioners are paying thirty dollars up to thirty dollars a month in order to pay their bills at Auspost. But that's probably, I just, can I just go back? So you've done this arrangement with the C, with the Commonwealth Bank, the NAB and Westpac, but not the ANZ, is that correct? We and have um, an arrangement in place with about 70 financial institutions. I'm talking about the big four. Yes, so that's, in terms that's four, correct. You don't have there's no arrangement with ANZ? No? Yes, that's correct. Um, can I ask which executives worked on the Bank at Post deal? Mr Gary Starr, myself and a, a lady called Deanne Kittler. Kittler and Nicole. Sorry, Deanne Kittler? Kittler General yeah. Manager of Financial Services. Um, and is that is that all? They were the senior managers. I mean, we could provide you a list. Team. It was yeah. a big team. We can provide you yeah, a list. Yeah, I would like a list. Yeah. And I'm wondering if, Mr McDonald, did you, as General Counsel and Corporate Secretary, do any work on this? Uh, yes, yes, I did, Senator. And uh, a member of my team on yes. the legal side was actively involved in the documentation. Right, and okay, so someone, a direct report to you? Uh, an indirect report to me, so. Right, oh, so who, who is that person directly reporting to? Uh, so, reports to my Deputy General Counsel. Who's your Deputy General Counsel? Uh, Philip Govey. Thank you. So is that Covey or Govey? Uh, Govey, with a G. Govey, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, so Mr. Boys didn't work on the agreement. It was before he joined the organisation. It's before he joined the organisation. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Boys, when did you join? Uh, thank you, Senator. Twenty uh, seventh of May uh, last year. Twenty nineteen. Okay. Uh, okay. Did when this. Arrange, so when was this arrangement, when was it entered into for the three of the four, big of the big four? So I, the CBA, yeah, when, when did you enter in, when did this sort of finalise? October 2018. Um, Ms Holgate, did you reward the team who worked on the agreement? Um, there were a small number of senior people who'd put in an inordinate amount of work in, and they did receive an award from the chair, myself, and on behalf of the board. And what was that award? They got watches. And what, what were the watches? They were a Cartier watch of about a value of $3,000 each. So how many watches did you buy? I, if I recall correctly, and Gary may recall, I think it was four people. Four people got Cartier. Do you remember the, the brand, the type, the, the, 
There was a Cartier tank. Was what was it? I don't recall. I didn't actually per, um, purchase them. They were organised through my office on behalf of the chair and I. Okay. So just to be clear, the four people who received Cartier watches was Mr. Starr. Um, you received one, Ms. Holgate. No, I did not. No. Okay. So Mr. Starr received one, Ms. Kittler. That's correct. Did Ms. Kittler receive one? Yes. Did uh, who else received one? A lady called Anna Bennett, who works in our strategy team, and a gentleman called Greg Sutherland, if I recall correctly, Gary. Gary was Sorry. running the project. Apologies. And so not Greg, not Greg Suth not Greg, but Gary Covey. Govey. No, no, Greg Sutherland. Greg, Greg Sutherland. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, sorry, what does he do? He's left the organisation. Oh, what did he do? He did business what? development. Okay, and was that purchased on the corporate credit card of, in the name of the office of the CEO? I don't recall, Senator. I'm happy to take it on notice. Well, does Mr. Boys know? Unfortunately, Senator, I, I'm not aware either. We, we would have to take... Mr. And Mr Boyce, just so you're aware, I'm going to come to the question on notice in response to question... Your response to question on notice 1740, where you said you were unable to provide a breakdown of the corporate credit card because of COVID-19. And I presume that you actually did some online banking. But I'm going to come to that. But just on this, you can't tell me what card this was purchased on. And you're the CFO. You can't tell me you spent um, you, sp you spent twelve thousand dollars. You can't on watches, and you can't tell me which credit card you you put that money on. Uh, that's that's correct, uh, Senator. You, I, I, you are the chief financial officer, and you can't tell me where the expenditure was put against. I cannot because I haven't had that question today. So uh, Australia Post has $7.4 billion worth of uh, expenses. Um, we we look after those expenses uh, and take great care with those expenses. So when, but when was when this really? is, uh, okay. this is some, some when was that ago. when was that when was that purchase made? What month was that made in, and what year? I believe, Senator, it was October I'm 2018. By, so in October 2018. Uh, you purchased four Cartier watches, and you're going to come back to me about where, which credit card, or did you do a direct transfer to Cartier? Was that in Cartier in Sydney? Were the watches purchased out of Cartier in Sydney? No, they were not. Where were they purchased Melbourne. out of? Melbourne. Were they purchased? Melbourne. Melbourne. Well, that is quite close to your headquarters office in Melbourne. Um, was fringe benefits tax declared on these watches? Senator, I'd have to take it on notice. I, I wouldn't know. I'm assuming so because our finance team are very vigilant about going through um, fringe benefits tax. But I can happily take it Sweet. on notice. Lovely. Um, Mr. Starr, are you wearing the watch now? Uh, no, I am not, Senator. Did you gift it to anyone else, for example, your wife? No. Um, do you, Ms. Holgate, consider it appropriate to use taxpayers' money to buy Cartier watches for already highly remunerated Australia Post executives? I have not used taxpayers' money. We are a commercial organisation. Um, Australia Post is... <laughs> we do not Australia receive government funding. We are a commercial organisation. and it was a government a organisation. It, it was a recommendation from our chair that these people get rewarded. Well, 
Well, I'm going to come to your board not making themselves available and being essentially invisible men and women, um, but I'll come to that a little later. I'll move on, Chair, to another topic. Um, could I ask, just on in terms of the timetable, uh, I want to ask about, your, on your website, you have a Christmas timetable for delivery. Um, it's called, the, the website, um, I guess the, the heading of it is um, getting ready for Christmas. And it contains information about how early people should post their products so they arrive by Christmas day. It covers parcels and international letters, but it doesn't say anything about domestic letters. So can I ask if I wanted to send a Christmas card from Melbourne to Sydney, how many days in advance should that card be posted so that I could be confident it arrives on time? Um. Senator Kitchen, it does say on the website that for letters within Australia for Christmas... Oh, who's that? Is that you, Miss Sheffield? Yes, it is. Is that you, Miss Sheffield? Yes, it's yeah, Nicole hi. Sheffield. Hi. Yeah, it, it, we, we actually have stated that for sending letters, including Christmas cards within Australia, standard delivery timeframes apply. And then we obviously have our standard timeframes depending on where you are um, in the country. You can look that up. Okay, so you can look that up on the website? You can. And um, do post offices put notices in, I don't know, you know, yeah. notices in their window or anything like that? Yes. To, to in customers? Right, okay. Right. Good. Yeah, we have actually, um, we've, we've, because of COVID and all of the restrictions and challenges that everyone is having at the moment, we've actually yeah. really pushed very hard on trying to get Australia to send early this year. So the post offices have all had a number of post of posters delivered to them, which many of them have already put up. Um, re regarding the timetable, um, all of our postal managers, have they have a post office portal called POP. We update information on that so that they have access to that and they have all the delivery times. But overall, we're encouraging the country to send early this year because it is an unusual year. Mm. Um, could I ask, did Australia Post miss its prescribed letter standard in July? So I've, I've got a, I'm looking, um, it's in the regs uh, and so from, sorry, I, it's just glitching. Could I ask, so I'm, I'm looking at the index under delivery time for reserved services letter. And obviously we've moved from, in the capital city of the state, uh, the delivery address is within that capital city. Uh, it was um, one business day, day of posting, now moved to five business days after a day of posting. Did you meet your prescribed letter standard in July. Rod. Rod, would you like to answer that question? I apologise, Senator. I really haven't been hearing your question. I got some of that, but I didn't get all of it. Something about July, <laughs> Senator? Yeah, July, your prescribed letter standard. Um, for the I need to take that on notice just to check the actual yeah. numbers, but if I look at the national performance for our regular service in July, I have that at 95.9% as a national number, Senator. Can you, it's 95.9? Can you, can you, give, could you give me by state? Um, so by Victoria uh, for August was 86.8. Yeah. Um, no, right. clearly, so you did, yeah, yeah. yeah. So clearly, in, in August, you remember that that was when also we were subjected to the one-third labour restrictions, which impacted our mail facility at Dandenong in Victoria. So instead, in five days, so if I send a letter with it, Melbourne. Um, in being five days, what was it? Um, Senator, I'm. The, the, the target that we hit is, is measured on the five, so it won't measure what percentage was it, six or seven. 
Um, so I, I, I take that on us if I can understand your question better. So it's, just, it's cutting out, so I apologise. I'm not getting all the questions. Okay. So what I'm after is for where you did, I'm going to come to August. So can you give me a breakdown of July, August and September by state and whether the mail delivery standard, what the percentage was that you met the mail delivery standard and where you missed it. I'll take the average of what, um, you know, instead of five days, maybe the average was seven, for example. Yes. Do we, do we like that verbally now, Senator, or do we, we, can I send that to yeah. you in a, in a sheet? You can uh, send it to me in a sheet, um, but I am interested, um, you'll have to forgive me for being parochial, but I am interested in, in Melbourne mail delivery um, and if you can tell me that now, uh, that would be good because obviously we've been inundated with complaints from people in Melbourne where their mail is sometimes taking three weeks across the city. Um, so, Senator, I, 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 the three weeks is, is surprising and I'd be very happy to look at that. I can tell you for uh, you. Victoria, if you look at July, we had a Melbourne number of 95.1. In August, it dropped to 86.8. But you remember from the 10th of July, the labour force restrictions I... first came into play, right? That also was present yeah. in September. September dropped further to 77.9. Since the removal of the restrictions, October to date is running at 93.2. So in, you're getting 93% of letters delivered in five days, correct. in the five days? That's correct. Okay, but I would like it by state as well, because there's been many instances, I mean, I'm happy to remove people's names from emails and send them directly to you, and you can deal with these people who are sometimes, it is taking a very, it's taking an unacceptably long time for people to get mail across a city. Uh, Senator, I'd be very happy to take those examples and look yes. into those. Although letters are not tracked, mm -hmm. there is a barcode on the back of the letter. When we get them, we can determine whether there's been a hiccup with that letter, whether there's been an addressing issue, or whether it's been subjected to some sort of problem. Three weeks is not acceptable, mm -hmm. and uh, I'd be more than happy to take them on notice, Senator. Mm -hmm. And Senator, well, I've got a, Senator, yes, Miss Holgate. On the company website is my email address, and many customers write to me directly whenever they have a delay, and we always ensure it's followed up with. Okay, so and um, who does the following up? It depends on the nature of the inquiry. So there's a team in customer services, a team in Rod's team. It depends on the nature of inquiry. Well, there's a grandmother on the Gold Coast who's trying to get letters. She writes to her grandchildren in Brisbane every week, 70 kilometres away, and it's taking 10 days for her grandchildren to get those letters. And that it's, that's an average. So it's been happening for months. But she hasn't been able to see them through the pandemic. Um, I just, just going back to uh, the um, Cartier watches, can I just ask, I'm just going to be clear that you said that in October 2018? If I recall correctly, but I will take it on notice and we will go back and find out for you. Yeah, lovely, thank you. Um, could I go now to... Um, to the Board of Australia Post, and it is unfortunate that no one from the board was able to attend estimates. Um, could I ask you whether board members are required to enter declarations of interest? Mr McDonald? Uh, yes, thank you, Senator, for that question. Uh, we directors are required to um, complete declarations of interest. 
uh, they are subject, as are other um, Australia Post personnel, to a conflicts of interest policy, uh, and uh, we maintain records of those declarations. So, firstly, can I have the policy for conflict of interest, if you're able to table that to the committee? Is someone that able to do? Is someone? Are you? Can I ask you, Mr. McDonald? Are you um, doing this from? Are you at your residence, your home residence today? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, can I ask? Um, if, is someone watching this in your team who's able to email now? Uh, yes, there is, and I'm sh sure they'll be able to Thank track you. that down. And is, are those registers of interest kept up to date? Uh, yes, they are. As we're notified of uh, interest, we maintain that in our records. So is there in the policy, the reason I really want the policy, is there, uh, so do you have to declare within a month, for example, or, uh, you know, so when you get them, I can imagine that you've got a team and someone dates the register, mm -hmm. but are you reliant or is there a time, lim time sort of zone in which directors have to declare there's a conflict of interest? Right. Uh, I'm not aware of a specific time frame, uh, but we can take that on notice uh, to clarify and make sure that uh, uh, we give you the right information there. Um, my understanding is, is that that obligation to declare those interests applies as and when they arise. Uh, right, OK. And, and we take uh, a summary of um, directors' interests to, each, um, to meet each meeting as well. So, uh, as well, directors can declare interest during the course of meetings. Right. So, so it would be a standing agenda item, for example, that you'd have a, a um, conflict of interest item that might come up at every every Australia Post board meeting. Uh, yes, uh, save for out of cycle meetings that might be doing a deep dive into a particular topic, but yes. For a regular board meeting, one of the standing agenda items is the members' interests. Uh, and uh, on the rare occasion that a, a conflict issue arises during the course of an agenda item, uh, then the relevant mm -hmm. director will declare that interest and act accordingly. And do you give training on that to board members? Uh, we do give training to board members from time to time. Uh, yeah. the, this particular policy is part of the materials that are provided to directors uh, when they begin with the organisation. Yes, yeah. Um, so can, oh, can I ask, just, so does the board meet once a month? Uh, the board's regular meetings are eight times a year. Uh, right. So sometimes it can be monthly, sometimes there's a larger break between, but they then meet as required. Like at, at, at Christmas, for example. At Christmas, yeah. for example. Yeah, so yeah, yeah the, the regular schedule uh, is February, March, May, June, August, October, December. Okay. I think. And then you've got, can I ask you just about the, the subcommittees of the board? So you'd have something like an audit and remuneration Yes. So we, and have what a, else? Uh, yeah. so we have an, an audit and risk committee, uh, yeah. we have a nomination and remuneration committee, uh, right. we have a people and sustainability committee, uh, and we've recently uh, added a safety committee, uh, and that was effective 13th of July this year. And was that in response to, to, the, to COVID-19? Uh, no, it was in response. It was in response to our, our chair doing a, a, a review of the committees, uh, and given, as several other people have said today, uh, safety is our number one issue. Uh, it was a way of recognising that at a board level, so that right. there's a specific committee dealing with safety. Can, can I ask where the chair is based? Is he which city is he based in? Uh, New South Wales. In, in Sydney. Uh, I believe so. Um, can, can I ask why he wasn't... I mean, you're all here, other than a bit of uh, glitchiness before, um, it's been pretty good. Why wasn't he able to or willing to attend a spillover hearing? His whole... um, so, or Mitch McDonald? Yes, I'm happy to respond to that. Uh, yeah, sure. The, the prospect of a spillover hearing was not something that was raised with us. Uh, earlier in the session today, there was some discussion about that. And as I understand it, that that's something that the committee intends to put to us. 
uh, mm. but has not at this stage. So it was never something that was um, considered in our correspondence with the committee. So for this committee, he offered he wasn't available, the deputy chair wasn't available, a senior board member wasn't available, no one seemed to be available. Um, and then the chair said he only wanted to take questions in writing. So th that's, that's not correct. Uh, what the chair said was that he was unable, unfortunately, to attend at the hearings uh, in this round because of a, a medical commitment related to an immediate family member. Uh, that was communicated uh, after he was invited and uh, that was reiterated uh, in further communications. Uh, what he did say when responding to uh, requests for the deputy chair to attend was uh, that he is, of course, uh, uh, available to answer any questions that are put in writing on notice, given that he wasn't going to be attending the hearing. So uh, the way so, in which that was characterised is not correct. OK, so you've said there are eight board meetings per annum, approx you know, yes, maybe really there's is. more or less some years, but um, but, and he's being paid $200,000 per annum to be the chair of Australia Post. I, I don't have the exact figure in front of me. I, but it's approximately that. It's, it's approximately that. I think it's slightly less than $200,000. Yeah. OK, so, but do you think he's going to be able to attend the spillover hearing? Do you think he's going to try to make himself available? I don't know. That's something I'll need to uh, seek instructions from him on once we get those spillover dates. Why was the deputy chair not available to attend today? Uh, the, the request regarding the deputy chair was put to the chair um, and uh, we responded through the committee uh, secretariat uh, and uh, the chair's view uh, was that the appropriate person to represent the board at these hearings was the chair. Uh, in respect of the deputy chair, uh, she has only joined the board uh, at the end of June. Uh, she was not uh, a member of the board at the relevant times of the remuneration issues that have been raised were discussed, uh, at least not the full cycle of those decisions. Uh, and uh, she is had only just recently returned from a period of leave. So uh, it was considered, as I understand it by the chair, uh, that it wasn't appropriate for, for her to represent the board. And how long was her leave period? I believe it was about three and a half weeks. Senator Kitchen. Oh, okay. So, so hang on a sec. So just, yeah, sure. Sorry, Senator Kitchen. Thank you, Senator Kitchen. Yeah. I just want to put on the record that obviously uh, Ms. Holgate is not only the managing director, but she also sits on the board, and it is not unusual for um, a government agency to appear without a chair. Certainly, the ABC appeared yesterday without a chair, as did SBS appear yesterday without a chair. In fact, that is standard practice. Well, we asked for the chair to come, and when the chair wasn't available, we asked for the deputy chair. We now find that this leave period was only three and a half weeks, so she's just come back from three, three and a half weeks break, and now, you know, she can't appear. Um, and then we asked for a senior board member to come. They weren't available. And, in fact, Mr Stanhope, when he was chair, appeared uh, at estimates. And I would have thought that, uh, that it would have been uh, good for the chair to be able to attend. But we'll have a spillover and maybe the chair will make himself available at the spillover. Um, can I just ask just about um, just some further questions of the, about the board? Um, can I ask, is Mr Tony Nutt, a non-executive director on the AusPost board, is he a current or a former member of the Liberal Party? Uh, I don't know. Well, the Post doesn't maintain a record of the political affiliations of its directors or employees. OK. Um, is it ever discussed at board meetings that Mr Nutt is known by some as an iron fist in a velvet glove or as the Svengali? I have never heard those things mentioned. What business experience in logistics did Mr Nutt bring to the board? Uh, I think questions about the skills and experience of directors uh, matters for the government. They appoint directors to the board. Okay. So if you were aware of anything like, you know, a lot of boards will have something like a skills matrix 
to ensure that they cover off necessary skill sets. Do you have one of those for the board? Uh, we do, and that's something that uh, is taken into account by the chair when corresponding with ministers about uh, vacancies on the board. Um, so that matrix is something that's prepared as part of our board review that happens on a, a cycle every uh, every two years. Uh, also, okay, every two years you do that. Mm. Is it possible that you can table a copy of that? Uh, I'll, I'll take that question on notice. Okay. I don't necessarily, I can understand if you don't want names attached to that, but I would like to understand where the chair, and I presume it is it's, is the chair doing this, where he can sit, what he can, skill sets he considers necessary uh, for the Board of Australia Post to have. All right, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll take that on notice. Thanks. Um, is Mr Bruce MacGyver who's also a non-executive director on the Ausposts board, a current or former member of the Liberal Party? Uh, again, I don't know, and that's not a record that Australia Post maintains. What about Ms Wilmot? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Mr. The Honourable Michael Ronald Ronald Ronaldson is a non-executive director. Is he a current or a former member of the Liberal Party? I don't he was know. A, a Liberal Party. Yeah, and look, we are aware that of, of his, um, his his former roles, but I, I don't know the answer to the question. And, and believe me, Mr Macdonald, I'm the last person to suggest that parliamentarians don't have uh, things to offer to the general community. I'm just interested in the makeup of the board. Understood. Has, has the chairman uh, ever attended a Liberal Party fundraiser? And uh, would that be declared? I don't know, and I would expect that if he did, it would be declared. Can you check the register of interest for me? Uh, yes, I can take that on notice and we'll check. Um, has Mr Mario Durazio ever attended a Liberal Party fundraiser? Uh, I don't know. And again, I can, I can check in our register to see if uh, such an attendance has been declared. And if they're not declared, are you going at the next board meeting, which will be in December, I think, uh, according to what you've said before, um, is that uh, going to be updated or will there be a question asked if they're not declared just to make sure that you've covered off on any conflicts of interest? Uh, so our next board meeting is the 23rd of October. Um, right, okay. So tomorrow. <laughs> All right, okay. Look, we, we didn't have any. We're probably quite busy. Yes, so we, we didn't have any particular plan to uh, refresh uh, that reminder, uh, but that is something that I could do. I think that would be a good idea. No. Well, no. Can, can Australia Post, uh, if there's a hearing, an, a spillover hearing that's coming up, do you think that the chair will be able to appear? Uh, I don't know. That's something I'll have to put to the chair and seek his instructions. It would be, I think, it would be very good for the chair of Australia Post, given there have been a number of um, articles in, and, and certainly in also your responses to questions on notice, if the chair made himself available. Oh, well, I undertake to pay that view to him. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to the engagement of domestique. I don't know whether they say it in the French way, but or domestic, but I prefer domestic. Um, a firm of at which Mr. Ross Thornton is a partner. So I'm going to refer if you if you want the question on notice, it was in question on notice 1740. Has not ever been involved in discussions about the potential engagement or the engagement of Mr. Thornton at Australia Post in his own capacity or in his capacity as a partner of Domestique? So I can answer that question. Yeah. Is that Ms Sheffield? It's Ms Sheffield, but you broke up at the beginning there, Senator. Could you just repeat? Oh, I'm just asking, has Mr Nutt, has there ever been any discussions, oh. Mr Nutt had any discussions about the potential engagement or the engagement of Mr Thornton, either in his own capacity or as um, a partner in the firm Domestique? Well, I can answer that. I engage Domestique and I definitely have not had a conversation with Mr Nutt about them. Okay. And why did, you in, why did you engage them? 
Well, at the time, it's it's you know it's common I, for us to use experts in different areas, and we were as we were in the middle of a pandemic and rolling out temporary regulatory relief. There were a number of stakeholders that we we're engaging from our communities, from you know. Um, uh, our, our marketing, our comms function, our corporate affairs, and it, it, we needed an, an expert in that field. And um, Demistique was a number of um, firms that deal with issues management and communications, and they became recommended from a different a number of sources. And we, as an executive team, discussed it and decided the best thing to do was engage an external firm because often someone the externalizer is going to provide you with um, different advice. Yeah, no, no, I can, I understand that. Can I ask, did you go through a tender process? Did you, I don't know, look at three firms or five firms and then say, um, you know, interview people or what, how did you arrive at Domestique? So we had a number of internal discussions. There's, you know, a few of these firms are known to us within the organisation and have, we've used them from time to time, depending on what we needed. Um, but we did not go through a tender process at that time. Okay, so when you say they're known to you, how are they known to you? Just through our work, um, you know. Um, Since the previous year, Senator, um, we engage yes. we engage somebody, and I think at that moment in time, um, they looked at a number of different companies, and Domestic was one of was one of those who were reviewed. Um, we chose for a particular piece of work to work with somebody. It wasn't my decision. I'm just aware of it. It was. Um, oh, whose decision was it? Was was that Miss Sheffield's decision? Whose decision was it? Yes, it was. Domestic. No, I'm talking about Sue Ketter. Oh. So sorry, Sue Ketter. Yes, we we worked with and Sue. And what did Sue? we work with? We got some advice with Sue previously, and um, yeah. I had to have to take it on notice whose decision it was. But I am aware that when. They went through that process to look at whether they worked with Sue, they looked at domestic, and I think they looked at one other, but I'm happy to come back and give you clarity. I, I, would, I would like some clarity. And can I ask, do, um, is um, Sue Ketter, is that, is, does she work, does she do um, consultancy as an individual or on behalf of the firm? She has, I mean, own, she has her own mm -hmm. firm, I'm just not, familiar with what the name is, so my apologies. Right. No, no, that's okay. But you'll, you'll take that on notice and you'll let us know the name of the firm. And can I ask, has, does um, Ms Ketter do any work regularly with Mr Thornton? <coughs> and, you know, is there, uh, if you're doing work with her and she's recommending a firm, I just want to know, uh, why, you know, how that relationship works, or is it just someone she had heard of? Um, Mr. Thornton is well known, he's done work for James Hardy and um, various Always. banks. Um, no, I think <laughs> yes. I don't, I don't want to apologize if I didn't articulate it very well. She provides a similar service to Mr. Thornton, yes. No, and I'm, that's why I'm asking if they've worked together no, in the past. Don't, not, we don't know, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes I think all things being equal, people do business with people they like. So, you know, I'm aware that sometimes someone will be very comfortable working with someone else and therefore they'll recommend them because it, you know, it can be, um, you know, for various reasons anyway. But can I just ask, just Ms Sheffield, your role is at the head of consumer and customer community, um, community and consumer community and customer. Is, that's correct, isn't it? So, but you're engaging PR. W would that not does public relations sit in your um, in your role? So my role covers really the consumer side and the community sides of Australia Post, and a large function of that is community relations and yeah. its marketing. So um, corporate comms does not report into me, but we have a very w close working relationship and there is a lot of stakeholder management and engagement that sits across the organisation that I oversee. 
I, I can imagine there is a lot of stakeholder management. Can, um, so where does corporate comms sit in the org? <laughs> Under whom does that? I'm just. Apologies for looking off to the side. I'm just looking at the at the witness list for today. So I'm trying to work out where um, public relations would would that go under maybe Ms. Day? Cor sorry, corporate communications. Does that go under? Wh whom does that go under? Which Mr. John? Cox. Which? Ex oh, sorry. Who's that? Mr. John Cox is the executive director for transformation and enablement. And he isn't here today. No. Okay. Where, where's he based? Melbourne. He's, Melbourne. Um, um, who, can I just ask, you know, the postcard, the first draft of the postcards that went out explaining the. Um, uh, that was done in the voice of the postie, if I can put it that way. That were pulled. That were pulled. Who drafted that? Where, we, who drafted that in the organisation, or was that a Mr. Thornton? No, it was not a Mr. Thornton. Oh, so who so did that? The the original postcard. We will have to take that on notice yep. as to who drafted it, but it would have been within either our marketing or our corporate comms teams. But we'll we we'll, can take that on notice. Okay, so and would that so they're both marketing and corporate comms go under uh, are under Mr. Cox? No, marketing is so, part of community and consumer. Oh, so un, under you, Miss Sheffield. That's right. Marketing is under you. Yes. Right, okay. So someone in your team, did you sign off on on the postcard? No, I, I did not sign off on that postcard. Who signed off on it? So at the time, the postcard was there was a committee assigned to a number of communication strategies. There was a very comprehensive document um, that was completed by that corporate comms team and all of those people in the um, committee, and that postcard formed part of that that document. So it went through that process within the organisation. So, Senator. So effectively, oh sorry, yes, Ms. Ms. Holgate. Sorry, just for clarity, because just so in. We don't yeah. provide confusion. The co corporate communications team who um, prepared the well prepared the postcard. Don't know if they wrote it, but prepared the postcard. Um, report to Mr. John Cox, and they shared that postcard with a broad range of people in the delivery area. Senator Kitching. So also, who's so Senator who's Kitching, just to let you know, you've had a very good run here. Uh, I'm going to wind you up in a couple of minutes to uh, pass so, the call over. So finish your line of questioning, and I'll be passing the call to Lovely. Senator Hanson. Okay, I, I am nearly, and I do appreciate it, Chair. Thank you. Um, can I say the corporate comms team reports to Mr. Cox? Marketing reports to Ms. Sheffield. You informed another committee that was made up of people from different areas is that correct that's right and that did the post yeah which we which is very common when we have big programs yeah. of work that are cross functional yeah. across the organization we bring working groups together that have expertise in various areas and you know ensure that we are communicating and working on a project plan that we're all working towards you said there's a comprehensive document. Are you able to table that? Yes. I think you were saying it was. Yes. You're able to great table that, and if you can get someone in your team to perhaps email it to the secretariat, they'll be able to um, distribute it for the committees. But can I also ask yeah, just we'll on that? Yeah, we'll take it on notice. We'll take that on. Oh, notice. okay. Yeah. Okay, no, that's fine. Yeah, you might want to. Rem yeah, take out names or. But can I just ask you, in terms of that, and this is sort of my last question, Chair, and thank you again. Could I just, on the, um, if this is for large scale projects and that committee was doing that work and that committee was only dealing with large scale projects, then why did someone think only 30,000 had been printed? So at the time, there was confusion about the question that was asked. There were 30,000 delivered to a delivery centre that were planning to be distributed um, when we received the complaint. And so, but we have, we, as soon as we understood that it had been miscommunicated, we clarified that with the journalist immediately. Did you also then write to 
the, the minute. Did you correct the Quan, the, the response? I'll have to take that on because notice. I understand, Nick. I understand you would want to go back to the journalist, but I also think it's important that the Senate yes. and the committee in particular also receives updated or corrected information. I'm sorry, sure but perhaps can I can I perhaps Mr. Disagree? McDonald? Uh, thank sure. you, Senator. Uh, so there, there was a set of questions I noticed regarding this uh, topic, 1876, uh, and in yeah. that response, uh, there's discussion of this issue around the number of postcards. So this mm. response was delivered to the Senate after the contact was made with the journalist to correct the error. So the response that's been given to the Senate is accurate in that it talks about the 6 million units. Yeah. Uh, it acknowledges that there was an error with the 30,000 and explains the source yeah. of... Uh, and the other thing I, I might mention, just in response to one of your earlier questions around approval, uh, those responses um, record that the approval of that postcard was from the EGM of Transformation and Enablement, John Cox, uh, mm. just to clarify that point. And no, while thank I'm, you. And while I'm talking, I might just add that uh, the group conflicts of interest policy has been yes. uh, provided to the council. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you very much, Mr. Thank McDonald. You. Um, Chair, thank you. I've finished this line of questioning, but I do have other topics. I'm sure we will come back to you. Uh, <laughs> Senator Hanson <laughs> Young, you have the call. Thank you. Um, I understand you've covered. Um, Many of the different issues uh, this morning in relation to the new delivery model um, and the impact on delivery times and all of those bits and pieces, which um, uh, you know, I guess I know from um, particularly my colleagues in Melbourne, they're particularly concerned about the delivery times and what's going on in relation to people in, um, uh, in lockdown trying to get their parcels. Um, but I actually wanted to, to, to go back to this issue of um, the bonuses for executives and staff. Um, you know, there's not often in Senate estimates that we have um, a situation where more money is being spent than what was budgeted that uh, we know what, you know, if you work in the public service, we know what uh, the public service wages are. Um, it's a, it is a different kettle of fish when it comes to the Australia Post because of the nature of uh, Australia Post. But I think given what is going on right now in the middle of a pandemic in uh, the worst recession since the Great Depression, I think voters and the Australian public have a right to kind of question these things. Um, so I'd really like to understand what the reasoning is for the bonuses, um, why you think they're appropriate, um, and uh, unpack that a little bit. Uh, Senator uh, Susan Davis, Exec General Manager, uh, People and Culture. So. Could you speak a little bit louder, please? It's um, quite hard to hear you, and Hansard okay. will Sorry. need your Okay, my apologies. Um, firstly, Senator, uh, there's, there's obviously our um, remuneration report has, has been published, mm. and so it's uh, all on public record of, yes. uh, of, of what has been paid. And I think the, uh, I'd just like to un underline that, first of all, the sort of key governance artefacts around our uh, REM policy um, uh, and, and the remuneration report are the REM policy itself, the corporate incentive plan rules, and the exec performance scorecard. So all of those are very transparent within the, uh, the REM report. I don't think it's the issue of transparency that's the problem. It's the concept. It's the concept okay. and in the middle of a time when sure. millions of people are either out of work or have lost hours, lost shifts. And sure. just to clarify, I mean, is it 92 million worth of bonuses? Is that correct? Is that the figure? Yeah. So if, if I may, I'll actually break that sure. down for you a little bit. So first of all, so the, the value of the incentives awarded was 97.4 million. Now, that's composed of three different parts. The first one is a thank you payment that we pay to all of our frontline operators. 
So that's 34,000 people, 34,500 people of our posties, <coughs> our processing centres, our line haul drivers, everyone who delivered through COVID, who continued to operate from March mm -hmm. through to today, um, in what are just unprecedented times. And how times. much was the thank you payment? So the thank you payment totaled 21.6 million. Um, and S per sorry. postie, for example, how, how, how much did somebody how much did somebody get extra in their their pay packet that that fortnight? So that was one percent of their average earnings. So that that was a, a thank you payment um, that that would be six hundred dollars to a postie who has. Uh, um, continue to work throughout COVID and serve the communities and serve Australia. In addition to that, within that thank you payment, we have three and a half thousand licensees um, and contractors. So um, again, we wanted to thank those people. So these are people who have operated our post offices and serve communities again through what are, have been very troubled times and unprecedented volumes. So the payments to the licensees and the CPAs was three million. In addition to that, we have uh, an extended um, workforce of, of contractors, ten and a half thousand um, courier delivery contractors, and receiving two point six million um, of, of the uh, of, of, of thank you payments. And in our Star Trek business, our Express and Premium participants receiving four hundred and fifty thousand. All of those people receiving a thank you payment um, f from Australia Post through operating through COVID. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, for all of those people within the thank you payment, it was set on a 1% of no. their base salary? No, with the licensees, um, it, it was slightly different. It was, it was just one-off payments. And so how much is that worth? That was five hundred dollars, um, and with it was it was uh, with the contractors paid by um, uh, gift voucher cards. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. So the total payment, um, the... Um, so sorry, hang on, sorry, just go back. So that's, uh, some people got $500 and other people got gift cards. So as you're probably aware, contractors and licensees don't actually work for us. So yes. they're not directly employed by, by us. Yes. So they were actually given gift cards as a thank you. It's the same principle, but they were given gift cards. So you spent $3 million on gift cards then? I'm just trying to be quite That's clear about it. Licensees and 2.6 million uh, with contractors, yeah. So 5.6 million on gift cards. That's correct. Okay. Um, uh, and in total, that's uh, $21.6 million worth of the thank you payment package. So, no, in total, 27.2 million. 27.2. Yeah, 21.6 million was the outcome. Oh, OK, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry. Yes, OK. Um, so where's the remaining 50 million? OK, so a second part. So uh, again, if I may just provide mm -hmm. some context on the Australia Post remuneration framework. Um, it's made up of two component parts. The first part being the fixed annual remuneration, the FAR, and the second part um, being the, um, uh, the, the, the performance at risk. So two parts of, of uh, salary, very common, um, and very common in uh, contract level employees. And the contract, the, the proportion of the at risk component that actually increases based on seniority, all of these are outlined in the employee's employment contracts, including the target incentive. So, um, two, two of those, and I'll break them into two parts. The first is our sales incentive scheme. Again, this is part of an individual's employment contract. The sales incentive scheme, uh, we actually paid out 9.6 million. Um, uh, and, and again, that was a reflection of the strong sales performance of the sales team and the tailored sales incentive scheme drives sales, revenue retention and growth. Um, and, and again, that was through an extremely difficult period, um, but it's, it's part of the remuneration framework. The second part um, was the Australia Post Corporate Incentive Plan, which we pay to two and a half thousand um, uh, employees in, in Australia Post. And there was awarded 60.5 million um, 
under the uh, to two and a half thousand uh, participants. Now, the participants of, of that uh, scheme that can actually range. Um, it covers obviously from. Uh, general managers to heads of department to senior managers. There are 669 frontline managers. So these are uh, managers and, and then there's further employees, 1,300 employees, so about 2,000 employees who again are out in our f facilities and our post offices and our network delivering through COVID in unprecedented times and unprecedented volumes. So again, um, part of their contracts of employment, um, they were paid a, a bonus based on a scorecard. Um, a scorecard is agreed at board level, so the executive scorecards are agreed at board level. From the executive scorecards, we then design the general managers and, and mm -hmm. the five levels down of mm -hmm. scorecards. Mm -hmm. How that, many executives got a bonus this year? No executives were paid a bonus for mm -hmm. 2020. And uh, the next level down, how many people fit into that senior management kind of uh, so rank? The next level down were general managers, and there were 67. And how much worth of the 60.5 million did they get? 10.1 million. Um, what is the reason that there was such a significant increase in uh, these bonuses? this year as opposed to last year. I, you know, the figures I've got is that it's it's an increase of around almost 84 million. Is that a, is that correct? You will see... 83.7. So you'll see from the... Um, again, this is all transparent within the, mm -hmm. uh, the REM and annual report, so you will actually see the, uh, the scorecard. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the specific metrics within the scorecard, there are a number of targets if you compare FY19 to FY20. There are a number of, of targets such as group revenue, group PBT, um, and, and a number of other targets where the target was met at stretch. And when you say revenue targets, you mean more money's been made that year, so there's more money to be handed on in bonuses? When I, when I talk about Obviously, revenue and, and more money being made. Obviously, PBT is, is uh, and again, that's reported in the annual mm -hmm. report, what we achieved. Mm -hmm. um, more money was made this year because there is more demand for things to be home delivered? Or because you've hiked your prices? Or a combination of both? Senator, we um, haven't fundamentally hiked our prices and apologies, I do appreciate you weren't able to be here, I think, mm. when we had it, a similar discussion in the inquiry. Um, we had actually, we were well ahead of our targets before we went into the COVID period. Mm -hmm. We had parcel growth, I think, of 11% at mm -hmm. that period of time, which is very unusual. And the scorecard is not just on financial objectives, it's on a number of different things. And again, it is inside the policy, inside the remuneration report. Mm. Um, do you think it meets community expectations? And I, everyone struggled this year. If you've got a job, you're lucky and you're working bloody hard to keep it. If you don't have a job, it's not because you don't want one. Everyone is working really hard. And uh, to see uh, a organisation that is still responsible to the public hand over that amount of money in what is considered to be bonuses, it just leaves a really bad taste in your mouth, doesn't it? Senator, I understand the, the, the sentiment. Um, you know, I, 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 we don't refer to these as bonuses. These are the at-risk part components of, of people's salaries that's in their contracts of employment. But if we step back and look at the, um, the vast amount, amount of that, that payment, the thank you payments to our posties, our contractors, our post offices, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely believe, um, and I, I do believe that our communities would feel that you know this this organisation 
has served the community and Australia. Um, you know, I've, I've seen, um, I've never seen the amount of, of volume that's come through. We've, we've worked in extremely difficult circumstances. If you look at, at um, Melbourne, um, you know, the, the circumstances that we've been operating on um, in, under, in Melbourne have, have just been phenomenal. You know, for a number of weeks with two thirds of our workforce with volumes like we've never seen. Hmm. And, I, I, you know, I, I, think I don't that, think it's the thank you payment that people are worried about. I mean, that only makes up 27.2 uh, million of the 97. It's the $50 million that's sitting there that's um, uh, that in the context that we're um, all struggling within right now, um, yeah, it's just I think it's a bit I on the nose. Yeah. So I, I, um, I can understand the sensitivity to executive pay all round. You know, and even if they're not executives, they're senior managers, and as you will know from our remuneration report the number of people earning over $200,000. The team have done a lot of work to actually try and modestly adjust um, senior management pay over the period of time. And I'm sure you're familiar with where, you know, there was a lot of feedback to our board three years ago, where we've come from there to where we are now mm. in relation to those pay levels we are actually contractually obliged to pay people. And if we don't pay them, we have to have a very good reason not to pay them. It's not a question of they can come for the year and then we can just decide, no, we don't pay you. Well, you've delivered a $53.6 million profit before tax, right? Uh, which is well up from your $15 million target. You've had a 17.9% increase in parcel deliveries. Is that, are those figures out of date? That, just to be clear, 17.9%, is that? I'm, I'm not sure familiar with that particular percentage mm. because if I may, we have Australia Post branded products, mm. Star Trek, international parcels, so there are different classifications, but happy to take it on notice. We actually put our parcel numbers domestically on our website, or the percentage of growth and up and down, after the request from the chair. Mm -hmm. um, my point being, financially you've done pretty well during this period. Senator, you've actually made money out of the pandemic. Senator, we actually our profits went down in the pandemic. They didn't go up. We were actually significantly ahead of our targets at the end of March. But I'm happy to get my colleague, the CFO, is here. Yep, sure. Mr. Rodney Boyce. Senator Hanson, you have much? Uh, Not much longer. Okay. Senator uh, Rodney Boyce, uh, CFO. Um, What's important um, here is we've had a uh, significant a lot of effort went in actually pre-COVID, pre-pandemic um, to to really reduce our costs. Um, you'll see in our full year announcement, we uh, saved on corporate and support costs uh, 62 million this year. That's, that's a strong focus. So yes, we've had an increase in parcel revenue and parcel volume. But we've, what comes with that is significant amount of in, increased cost. We had last year more than 20 million just in PPE, uh, sorry, hand sanitizer and protective equipment for our for our frontline team. We were paying and still are to this day over a million dollars uh, a week in, uh, in in airline uh, charters to try and uh, um, overcome the lack of uh, domestic passenger flights and international passenger flights. So we've had significant amount of costs. 
uh, increase with that revenue. And additionally, we've had this structural ex acceleration of the decline in letters, over 400 million less letters delivered last year than the year before. And yet we have to go to an extra 200,000 households or 200,000 additional delivery points. So we're seeing a lot of structural shift um, within the organisation. And if we go back a couple of years, the, the profit of 53 million um, is less than a half than it was a couple of years ago. And on $7.5 billion worth of revenue, it's it's less than 1%. It's, it's a very fine margin um, that Australia Post is operating on. So you made the profit prior to COVID is what you're telling me? We had a lot of things in place and we were ahead of budget in February and March pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. um, a number of those costs mm -hmm. have been met initiatives it doesn't, continued through. Last question, but that doesn't, that, that doesn't detract from the fact that you've posted a $53.6 million profit. You've done pretty well this financial year. We've done better than our target. I hardly think that $53 million on $7.5 billion is, is a really good result or that um, a 2% return on, on assets uh, or on equity is, is a significant result. But, you know, we, we need to reinvest for the future. We've got significant amount of investment. I reckon there's plenty of small um, businesses. I reckon there's plenty so of small businesses around the country who would <laughs> would like to be able to say that they got a profit this financial oh, year. Let's. I'm sure I, many, this is my problem. People. This is the concern that I have, is that um, Australia Post is, um, uh, you know, quasi public, quasi private, and I think at, this, at a time like this, this is where you've got a clash of community expectation. It's not necessarily your fault. Um, I'd say this is a, you know, this this is part of the uh, privatisation of an essential service, uh, and I think community expectation over bonuses, profits at the moment, at, in the time of a uh, recession, you know, that's where the rubber hits the road, and I can understand why people are pissed off. Thank anyway, you, thank you, Chair. Hanson Young, we'll take that as a comment, and perhaps just note that last bit of that was not appropriate for a parliamentary committee. Senator McMahon, you have the call. Thank you. Um, Ms Holgate, uh, could you tell me, the, um, the temporary regulatory relief allowed Australia Post to redeploy um, posties from what was a, a declining part of the business, i.e. letters, uh, to a rapidly expanding part of the business, parcels. Um, this was to best meet the needs of the customers. Um, how many more parcels have been delivered as a result of the temporary regulatory relief than would otherwise have been able to be delivered? I'm going to pass the exact number to Mr Rob Barnes, but we estimated, because there's different ways of delivering, that's all, we estimated that the posties had delivered something like 40 to 50 million more parcels by being in the vans already and of course, Senator, what's very important to me is that they're doing this safely. Uh, thank you, Senator. Just for the uh, short time that we've had the temporary regulatory relief in place and specific to the posties in vans, as of last Friday, the additional parcels that you would say uh, we could not have otherwise delivered is 4.6 parcels. So, sorry, what was that figure again? 4.6 million. Right, more more than what would have been otherwise. That's correct. Thank you. Um, could I, you just... Excuse me, Senator. Yep. Rod, I actually think you've got your numbers wrong. So, Senator, if we may take it on notice, yeah, I'll make a, sure someone clarifies tenfold. it. Yeah, discrepancy there in the two figures. So, yes, um, I'm happy for you to take that on notice and, and get back to us. Um, could you just reiterate how uh, your network has been interrupted by COVID? If I may start, Senator, and then I'm going to pass to Mr Rod Barnes. It's been massively disruptive and it's on many different sort of three prime levels. The first one is is that the um, freight network, so example Qantas, where we used to carry in the belly of their planes, clearly parcels and express posts around the country, 
from the 18th of March to the 9th of April, it went down to 40%, and then it was actually, they told us on the 9th, as the following Tuesday, it went down to 20%. We then had to supplement that with extra chartered airplanes ourselves, and I think you heard our CFO talking about the additional cost they were giving us. They weren't just planes, though. As many people are aware, and I think Senator Patrick's here, people like Greyhound buses, you know, they actually reduced their services to a third. Um, so we've had to work with many different ways of reconfiguring that, particularly long distance line haul network. The second thing is how we operate inside our facilities has had to substantially change to be able to meet the safety requirements. And the third part is like in Victoria, we've had even additional restrictions put on us. As I explained earlier, for um, right up until the end of September, we had to operate with just 67% of our people at our busiest time, even though our parcel volume growth in Victoria went up 175%. The four metre safe distance rule actually means that we have to completely split the shifts of the posties the second shift that comes in after a cleaning, the problem for that is those posties cannot, it's not safe for them to be going late into the night on a motorbike in the dark, so they have to return earlier. But Rod, is there anything I've missed or you would like to add? Uh, I can add some detail if the Senator has time. I mean, if we think through to, to, to bring that down to actuals, um, there are three main areas, as Christine's pointed out. The first is the impact to the network, so that is the restriction in our capability for either air and, uh, and uh, partners, such as bus runs that do our street bus clearances that can no longer operate. There are also some of the border changes that came through uh, that impacted. Then there are the proactive COVID safety measures we took as an organisation, independent of regulatory change. So as Christine refers to there, um, the impact of one of our major parcel centres being hit by that virus would be uh, quite substantial. So we divided all our facilities into zones where employees were kept within those zones for their use of utilities, lunchrooms. So that in the event that we had an outbreak, we would just be sanctioning that zone as opposed to the whole facility. That meant that we lost productivity. So if we think about, uh, if I can use the term, Senator, when we were firing all our cylinders pre-last peak, we were down to about 85% before any regulatory changes. Simple things like the number of people that can be inside a road trailer when unloading parcels. But the social distancing that Christine refers to has been quite significant. The other important point to call out is there's a massive network, as Ms Davies has referred to, with over 80,000 employees. That doesn't run itself without a lot of organisation. And our head office based in Melbourne has effectively been closed since March. Uh, we don't employ call centre operators overseas, they're all based in Australia. And with these huge volumes and huge pressure, they've all been working from home. So that's been a significant uh, challenge for those employees and also trying to train them and support them. Uh, as you can appreciate, uh, when things are uh, as challenging they are as in Victoria, uh, while the community has been incredibly patient with Australia Post, the word but does creep in after several weeks. Uh, and those poor staff are having to cope with those huge volumes of inquiries without that support and without the training. Uh, in, as we've rolled out this uh, alternate service and, and regulatory changes, we've required no less than five individual training courses for every postie. That's had to be done by a training workforce that's had to operate remotely without the ability to normally communicate and interact as you expect in a normal training environment. So that has been incredibly challenging. When you take those two factors and you mix them with complete retail closure in Melbourne and volumes upwards of 170%, uh, that is uh, quite extreme. And it leads us in a situation where not only we, we challenge with bringing pop-up sites, we can't automate those sites. So we literally have people handling that product manually. It is not something that I've seen, Senator, in, in my 30 years. Senator, my colleague would like to share something with you, if that is appropriate. Senator, I just wanted to add, um, as, as Mr Barnes said, these things 
didn't happen by chance with an, a workforce of 80,000 people during COVID. And, and, and Rob talked about the social distancing, um, staggered shift times, um, and, and the cleaning of facilities. We actually spent 20 million on PPE to keep our, our people safe. We were one of the first organisations to introduce pandemic leave, um, and, and a vast number of people have, have taken advantage of the pan pandemic leave. We've only had one workplace transition, 80,000 people, and we've had one workplace transmission throughout the whole of COVID. We've had 69 cases nationally. Um, we've had a number of people who have self-isolated. That didn't happen by chance. Um, we've worked really closely with Comcare, with the Vic and New South Wales Department of Health. Um, and, and we are so proud in, in how we've kept our people safe through such a difficult period. Thanks. Could you um, d detail some of the other steps um, that you've taken to, um, to keep delivering in spite of all these difficulties? So as, um, as Mr Barnes said, the, uh, and before I do that, one of the, the, the key things, um, and especially in, in Melbourne, but not just specific to Melbourne, we've done an awful lot to support people's psychological safety. Um, and people throughout the whole of the pandemic, but particularly in Melbourne these, these past couple of months, it's been extremely difficult. We've had 3,000 people uh, who have reached out and we've provided EAP services. Um, we've provided um, all of the things that you would expect us to do from a safety perspective with regards to mass sanitization, um, uh, you know, safe distancing, making sure, as Mr. Barnes says, running an operation where you've got a thousand people in a facility, you know, with two, three hundred posties, where you can't start them all at the same time because you have to social distance. So we then had to change people's shift times to make sure we can actually just keep things moving. And phenomenal effort by many of those people who we've just talked about, the senior managers, to coordinate um, a, a plan which had just been executed um, well. And obviously in the middle of that, ADM, we were just introducing ADM as, as we started to, uh, to move into COVID. So again, significant change for people um, as we transition. So the volume, I think, you, you know, many would have seen the CEO's reference to, um, you know, just the phenomenal, uh, the, the Suez Canal reference so where, Davey, you know. Sorry, we're going to have to wind you up there because okay, so we're no running problem. out of time. Senator Patrick, you have the call. I'm just wondering if you could advise me of the pathway back to five-day-a-week letter delivery. Um, do you mean not alternative day deliveries no. inside metro yes. areas as opposed to speeds? Yes. So, um, um, yeah. Thank you. The... Sorry, just for clarity. Yeah, no, that's, that's perfect. Um, Rod, would you like to share um, with Senator Patrick the plans that we are putting in place to prepare ourselves for the 30th of June? Yes, thank you, Senator. There, as you can appreciate, there are a number of factors that we have to model as we look uh, for change post the 30th of June. Uh, one of those clearly is our network capability, so how our network stands at the point in time. Uh, it is our view still in relation to air traffic and air capacity, also including international, that we will probably not see any significant change, at least until April. Uh, we feel that with current borders and current scenarios, in uh, December, we may get to 30 to 40 per cent of what I'll call was normal capacity. Uh, those are important for us if we're going to look at things like our priority letter service and our ability to particularly service regional and rural Australia. So that connect connectivity is something we're modelling quite closely. Uh, clearly the regulations and what impacts are, there are with COVID, so uh, very hopeful that as we see things improve we may be able to be a bit more conservative with things such as our social distancing and, uh, and those processes that have impacted staff for, for many months now. And then the demand. I mean, the parcel demand is one that is uh, something that I say is that we did not foresee in, in March. And particularly in Victoria at the moment, where I think it's fair to say it's a bit of a false demand because retail is, is literally closed. Uh, we don't know whether we will see the, the, that level remain. So we're busily trying to plan the volumes. We're getting a, a pretty good feel for the rest of the country as to where that is settling. 
uh, our merchants and our business um, senders are still telling us that they do expect record volumes this peak. Uh, that'll be particularly challenging and we'll need to, to, to play through that. And that is particularly helpful where ADM is coming on or the alternate delivery model for us to try and cope with those parcels. Uh, the other thing that's very um, fluid at the moment is the international environment. Uh, as the other countries start to get into the other wave, shall I say, of the virus, we are seeing that a number of their shipments that would ordinarily travel air freight are having to travel sea freight. Um, and we saw particular problems in the first wave where their capacity to send the parcels and letters to us, let alone deliver, was um, severely impacted. I have to be honest, but I can see that continuing for the next few months and what we're seeing in other countries. So all those factors we are modelling with, with a review to how we wind back the service and what state letters will be in too. Letters have continued to drop. So as we think about letters for the average postie pre-COVID, the postie was doing just under 500 letters per round. As we have moved to, to effectively bring those rounds together, that's jumped to 685, but still declining. So that, that is one we'll have to think very carefully about how we stretch those rounds and how we do that safely. We also want to achieve a reduction in our motorcycle fleet for, for clearly safety reasons. I hope that answers your question, Senator. That's so Senator, may I add something? I appreciate, I'm not sure if you were listening elsewhere, but earlier this morning, um, Mr. Windia explained that um, Minister Fletcher is undergoing a review at the moment and uh, has written to a number of different stakeholders. I think he committed that he would have a review before the end of this um, financial um, calendar year. And could uh, one of the outcomes of that review be, to be a status quo in terms of alternate days um, based on falling demand? Is that is that what you're suggesting? I think I should probably answer that on behalf of Post. It, uh, we wouldn't want to preempt the review. It's still early days. It was supposed to take place well, I was midway we'll through. Rule it out. Well, I don't think I can do that so, for you, Senator Patrick. But I don't think we would want to preempt the outcomes of that review. I know that the minister is uh, consulting widely, and and is following the procedure that he said that he would when the regulatory relief was originally granted. Would you accept that that would require, if, if you decided to maintain the status quo as, as, it, as it is now, you would need legislative change? Sorry, can you say that again? You would need legislative change because it's in the uh, customer service obligations within the Act. I think it's too early to preempt the outcome of the review. May, we know that this may is I give an a important issue. Clarity. I'm so sorry, Senators. Um, Senator Patrick, I don't want to put words into our minister's, you know, our minister's commitment to you, but I believe there was a commitment that he would review how regulatory, you know, the temporary regulatory relief was going before the end of December, a midpoint. The temporary regulatory relief is due to end on the 30th of June. So just for clarity, he's doing that midpoint review now. I'm guessing, if you know, depending on what he finds out, he might give us all feedback. But it it is the 30th of June that we are currently planning for that okay. this would be reversed. All right, I'll move on. Um, in terms of FOIs, um, uh, so you know that I've got an FOI, and I'm not trying to in any way usurp that process. But I have different rights in this forum. Um, uh, uh, but to be open, I have an FOI requesting any letters that, you, that the Australia Post may have written to entities or people where they may have raised the prospect of a police visit for not um, um, delivering uh, letters. Um, uh, obviously, we'd let that FOI run its course, but separate to that. Um, uh, have you identified any other instances other than Ms. Uh, Senator Hanson's situation where a letter, such a letter has been written? I'm going to pass to my colleague, Mr. Rodney Boyce, because he's in charge of group security, yeah. and he's going to share with you, because I appreciate you asked me last week to find out about the number yeah. of the times this has happened. Rodney. 
Thank you, um, Salgo, and thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, our security team um, often uh, experience uh, uh, instances where they have to engage with law enforcement agencies. There might be a, a van that gets broken into and, and letters and, and uh, parcels stolen or or a, uh, a street side posting Just to box. Stop you there. Box. That's not the burden of my question. My, the burden of my question is how often have has Australia Post written to somebody, uh, basically uh, indicating they will engage the police if they fail to deliver uh, parcels or letters? No, I, I, it's clear you would go to the police if a letter's been stolen or a truck's been yes. damaged. It's specifically and around it, those circumstances. It, and in each one of those, there's been about 2,000, each one of those we engage in writing with law enforcement. I think your question is, is slightly different. So um, I, that would be a legal question. If I may, I may pass to our uh, uh, legal counsel, Mr Mick McDonald. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rodney, and thank you for the, the question, Senator. Uh, so at the outset, it's probably worth pointing out that the, the situation that we faced was a, a very unusual one. So it's firstly unusual for Australia Post uh, to be releasing letters or parcels into the custody or control of a third party uh, prior to them being delivered to the addressee. So uh, that's the first point. Uh, on the rare occasions where we do that, um, the third party has generally fulfilled those responsibilities. So they've delivered those items as they've been addressed. Uh, and they've got to where they're supposed to go. So th this was the first situation that had been brought to my attention uh, where we had a third party that had the custody of parcels, and in this instance it was over 100 parcels, uh, deciding not to deliver them to the intended addressees. Uh, so I'm not a, I haven't written a letter like that before, uh, and I'm not aware of any other situations where a third party has intervened in that way and, and made that decision not to deliver the uh, deliver the mail where it was intended to be delivered. Okay, thank you. That uh, satisfies my question. Uh, thank you. Uh, d just uh, a couple more lines here, Chair. Um, uh, maybe you can m write to Mr McGowan and, and tell him that he's interfering with your postal deliveries with his unlawful border closures. But anyway, that's a comment. Um, the um, th There have been a number of, uh, well, there's been bad press associated with Australia Post, and I'm sure a lot of that's been agitated and talked about today. But I know you have engaged uh, someone uh, to looking at reputational management at a cost of about $3,000 per day. Has that been talked about today? Part of it has been talked about. I'm not sure what you're referring to. So I think you're referring to domestic. That, that's the company that's been engaged? That's correct. And what's the term of that engagement? Uh, and the total cost. So, hi, Senator Nicole Sheffield, Community and Consumer. Yes, we have engaged Domestique. Um, we d did not agree to a day rate at all, so we don't know where that figure has come okay. from. Um, the engagement was um, a retainer for a two month period, and the total spend with them to date is $119,000. And how much was. So how long have you they been engaged for? So the engagement now has been three months, yeah. but the um, retainer was just for the two-month period. Last question, thanks. Um, hang on, there's a... Uh, so, so, so you've extended so the contract? We haven't. It's not, a, it's not a contract per se. It's an engagement, and now we, we, we might use them for bespoke services. So that engagement covers not just that it's strategy work, it's facilitating meetings, it included training, it included a lot of things outside of normal, you know, um, advice. Okay, and um, was that obtained by competitive tender? It was not. What was the reason for not, not uh, going to competitive tender on that? Well, firstly, it was under the threshold okay, that we normally go to a procurement is, process. Yours is much higher. Sorry. Yes, yeah, our Apologize. thresholds okay. higher. Oh, so oh, that's so so Patrick, Patrick, just can you one more, one more question, just in relation. Your act of grace, questions. <laughs> okay, thank you. Don't ask for another. Well, Senator Stoker has a soft spot for um, certain senators, and I'm no, hoping, hoping you might. Uh, I'm, I was hoping you might like get on with it, please, Senator okay. Patrick. Um, I, I just want to draw. The CEO's attention to um, the fact the government has 
um, has uh, granted a, a total of $5 million to um, ACE Electric Vehicles in Adelaide um, for small commercial deliveries. And I believe you have engaged with ACE Vehicles in the past, and I really just wanted to make sure you are aware of that. So the government appears to be uh, sensibly backing uh, this proposal and um, just in any consideration you have in relation to your own requirements, I, I just um, draw your attention to clause 4.7 of the Commonwealth Procurement Rules that talks about economic benefits of particular purchases. I know that's not a question, I just wanted to put that. Take that as a comment and if Australia Post wishes to answer in any way, they can put that uh, in writing. Uh, Senator Kitching, you have five minutes before we go to the lunch Thank break. You, Chair. No extensions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just, um, just to, uh, we would seek. Uh, well, I'm going to just say that we wouldn't. Just so it's clear for Ms. Holgate, we wouldn't seek um, the chair of Australia Post's permission to attend a spillover but rather we will move on the floor of the Senate to require his attendance to come, just so that he is very clear, and I'm sure that Ms Holgate will be able to communicate that uh, intention to the chair of the board. Um, could I just speak to clarify uh, some uh, of some of the previous responses? In relation to Thornton, Ms Holgate, did you have any influence on that decision? Did you have any discussion with Nutt, for example, about Mr Thornton? Mr Nutt has never mentioned Mr Thornton to me. Um, did you and Ms Sheffield have a discussion about Mr Thornton? Um, I can't recall, but it wouldn't be unreasonable to say that would happen, but I cannot recall, Senator. Ms Sheffield? I, I, we discuss a lot of different um, strategies, approaches, etc. So I, I'm, I'm not specifically, um, I don't recall, no. Okay, so neither of you can recall having a discussion, anything in writing? Or, and by that I don't mean just email, I also mean by text, by WhatsApp, by any other platform you may use internally. Not to my recollection. Not to mine. So if we were to, to ask for a search of, um, of any communication, we wouldn't find any? Have, you know, Senator Kitchen, as I said earlier, sorry, as I said earlier, we did think about using Mr. Thornton, and I can't remember the exact date, sometime previously, and I was aware that we thought about him and um, Sue Cato's consultancy, and there was probably another one, but I don't recall, so happy to take it on notice, Senator. Um. Is it true that Mr Thornton was essentially running corporate affairs? No. Or I think the term you used before was corporate communications. No. So how many hours per day was he working? Let's take the two month period initially. So the, the consultation, the, the work was done by Domestique. So there were a number of people within Domestique that provided different services. And the hours, um, I would have to take that on notice, but that doesn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't Mr Thornton per se. There was a group of people involved, depending on what services we needed, whether it was strategic work, whether it was looking at um, media, um, assessing, you know, different elements of our entire, you know, campaign strategy work, community consultation, you know, there were lots of different parts of the organi our organisation and, and domestique's business that were um, engaged. Um, Mr McDonald, was it ever discussed at the board level? Uh, 
I can't recall. I'd have to take that on notice. Do you keep minutes? Uh, we keep minutes. Yes, I'm not aware. I'm certainly not aware of any reference to Mr. Thornton in the minutes. In any other documentation that might have been presented to the board, or any uh, minutes that were taken but not uh, formally accepted at the next meeting, if that sometimes the minute taker might make take a lot of minutes, or you some boards might record, and then the minutes might reflect. You know, different boards have different pro different practices, but they might then have a, a, a you know a summary of those of the discussion. What I'm asking you is to go and look to see whether it was discussed at a board level in any documentation that might have been made uh, by the board or for the board. Okay, I'll, I'll take that question on notice. Thank you. Thank you. And chair, I've just got one more thing. Could uh, one one more question, Ms. Senator Kitching. Yes, well, it's actually just on notice. If Ms. Holgate, I referred earlier to a question uh, asked by Senator Carr that related to the unaddressed mail service and that Ms. Holgate had received letters from posties, I would ask Ms. Holgate to table those letters. I'm happy to take it on notice. I don't know if I've got them anymore. Sure, that's fine. You can take it on notice. You, you don't keep the, You haven't kept the letters. Senator Kitching, thank you. I find that very you. difficult to believe, Ms. Holgate. Ms. Holgate, thank, thank you. you. I care. accept you've taken that on notice. Uh, can I say thank you for uh, you and your team for being here today for your evidence, and uh, we look forward to receiving the information on notice.